<laughs> why the intro didn't play. But ladies and gentlemen, we're here. We're live with the MMA holes. <laughs> what the heck? I that, don't know why that happened, but anyway, okay. How you doing, friends? Welcome to the show. UFC 280 is this week. My name is Mystic Moss. I'm here. I'm wonderful, wonderful. wonderful, wonderful. Not sure why the intro didn't play, but don't worry about that. We got a fantastic, fiery show tonight or today uh, planned for you over here. Everyone in the live chat, make sure you smash up that like button and stay wonderful, wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Da Deontay Wilder knocked out his opponent. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about UFC 288, but tonight... Today, whatever time it is by you over there on the interwebs, we got something special for you. First time on the show. I've been meaning to have this man on the show for a while. This man over here comes in at 29 years of age. This man over here comes in at 3-2 and two in the UFC off of a fresh, fast knock uh, submission. 30 seconds in his last fight a couple of weeks ago. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing to the show, Sadiq Yusuf. Let's go, baby. <laughs> hey, Sadiq. I tell you what, in the six years of doing this, this is the second time the intro decided not to play. Maybe it's going to be a magical day. Yeah, who, who was the first guy? <laughs> I don't remember. All I know is uh, I think it was actually a Contender Series guy that we had on, uh -huh. and I was like, okay. okay. <laughs> I was going to say maybe, maybe I was in, in a good company. <laughs> I don't know what the hell. That's the beauty of live streaming, you know? Do you, do you live stream? No, not not at all. I try to um get into some like Twitch stuff, but I've I've never been consistent on it. Yeah, it's difficult. It's stressful. It's fun though. Once you just get that audience going and interacting live, it's a lot of fun. Um, the closest thing to live stream is probably like I get on TikTok live. That's about it. But that's not really anything professional. It's literally just a camera. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about TikTok here because I'm I'm trying to my my wife is into it. Um, but I'm trying to figure this thing out. How are you doing on TikTok? Do you like it? Is it just that quick content that you like to consume? Yeah, well, I don't really I don't really watch it a lot. I just post like funny videos on there. Like I post funny videos and and I go live on there to like to talk to people about fighting and stuff like that. But I I don't use the app for viewing much. It's just like I post memes and things that I find funny. There you go. Yeah, I tell you what, man. It's quick. It's to the point, And it's one of the biggest platforms. It grew so fast, TikTok. It's crazy. Yeah, very. I, I went from, I went from like 6,000 followers to like 1.2 million in, in, in a couple, in a, like a month and a half. <laughs> oh, my God. So what is, is it like fight breakdowns that's the most popular stuff or just the funny <laughs> no, stuff? It's, it's, it's literally just funny videos. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just mindless entertainment, right? As, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and they, they say, um, I guess I'm a part of the problem, but they say like t TikTok in this country is is the algorithm is like that, but in other countries is based off of like like achievements. So like the kids are watching people succeed in like math and chess and stuff like that in other countries, but for America is just mindless fun <laughs> there's something wrong with this country there really is i love it but i mean we're, we're a bunch of zombies over here that's a fact <laughs> so i was looking on your uh twitter and i see that you're a fan of house of the dragon what are your oh, thoughts oh yeah oh if not for sure I, I um i was a big fan of game of thrones too i said I'm, I'm legally owed some compensation for what they did for season eight but <laughs> the, rest, the rest of the show is all good. <laughs> so, so it's funny. I have a hot take on that. So I love Game of Thrones. Absolutely love it. And um, when I watched it the first time through, you know, the ending was, it did feel sped up and this and that. A lot of people were complaining, going crazy. But when I watched it a second time, I, I don't know how many times you watched it, but when I watched it a second time, I didn't hate it. Like, I was just like, you know what? Yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll agree with you. Um, so my fiance never watched Game of Thrones. So me and her binged watched the whole show. And when while binge watching it, she didn't mind season eight at all. So I think because we had that time in between to prepare for what was about to happen. And all of us had a million different theories. But what the show gave us was worse than like everybody's <laughs> theories in the show. So I think that's, that added to the disappointment. Well, listen, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones yet, I do want to turn it off for a second. I do want to talk to Sadiq about this. So were you upset about Bran being the guy? Yeah, yeah, that's a fact. That's a fact. You was you okay with that? So at first, yeah, I was upset. I was upset. I was like, I couldn't stand him. I was so glad they took a season off from him. I couldn't stand him. Yeah. The guy. So I, I thought, to be honest, like his character was so like flaky. 
I thought maybe there was something going on with him where he was going to show that maybe he was actually evil or something like that, you know, because the three eyed Raven was a bit mysterious, too. And I was like, okay, why is the Night King going after Bran? Why is all this? I was waiting for some kind of plot twist to show up. The only thing that would have made sense at that at the end of that show is John being king. No matter what, it seemed like it was like a streamline, like they were heading towards that direction. Mm-hmm. And that would have made perfect sense. And there's a lot of other people that would have made sense too outside of Bran. <laughs> yeah, at the time, you know, originally I was like, this could be the worst possible decision. In, in high, now watching it back a second time, I still hate Bran, but I was like, you know what? It kind of makes sense. I wanted originally. I want Tyrion. Tyrion, that yes. guy stole the show from me at least. Yeah, Bran. Bran would make sense being like the hand of the king or an advisor. You know, somebody that has all that knowledge. And then I hate the part of the show when it was like, um, were, were you upset being king? Is like, why did you think I came all the way here? I was like, man, you <laughs> you can see the future. You've been telling us all this time you didn't want to be king. Like, why why was you doing this? <laughs> yeah, it was a little weird. So, are you going to watch like the Snow spinoff? Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, although season eight was a little bit flaky. One through six is probably the best um, seasons of TV history, you know? Like, it's undeniable. It's probably one of the best shows that I ever... Lived. Even seven wasn't that bad, but I think seven was... <laughs> was seven when um, Gendry ran from, 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 the, from, like, the other side of the wall all the way back to the wall in, like, in, like, in, like a day or two hours? It wasn't even a day. He literally just, just started running and made it back, made it back to send a message to Daenerys. I was like... <laughs> that's when he started seeing. That's when he started seeing like the show started like messing around a little bit. Season six had Arya getting stabbed in the stomach about ten times and jumping into 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 poop water, and she and she was perfectly fine when Khal Drogo died from like a paper cut. Yeah. I was like, man, come on, yo. But <laughs> like I said, it's still undeniable. The show, the, it's a great, it's a great story, you know. The, yeah. And what they're doing with House of Dragon now, like. Honestly, I, House of Dragon hasn't had a bad episode yet. It's been like the worst episode has been like a nine out of ten. Wow! So you really like House of Dragon? I'm gonna get to that in a second, and we'll talk about your fight stuff. But this is actually fascinating to talk about. Yeah, uh, oh, trust me, <laughs> I like talking about everything except fighting. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what's funny? We drag fighters on here. We're talking about scary movies. Like, I just want to know about you guys. I, we see what you do in the cage. That's a fact. That's a fact. So, what did you think in Game of Thrones? One of my favorite scenes ever is when Khaleesi had her fucking meltdown and took the dragon and just mowed down everybody okay. like what'd you think about that, that? I, I, I'm not gonna lie I didn't like that to, like to be honest I don't mind her turning evil it's just it was so jarring you know like th- I think they could have built that up better maybe they had like one more season in between mm-hmm. but it was so jarring because not only she could have done what she still did, except not kill everybody on her way there. Just fly straight to Cersei and kill her. <laughs> you know, it's like it, it makes no sense. Like you're you're just killing innocent people just to kill innocent people, and there's no um, there's no justification for it, um. Plot wise, and there's no justification for it, like as a strategy of war. You know, mm-hmm. it's like you're trying to rule these people. Like, why are you trying to why why are you burning them all down? Just go to the Red Keep, kill Cersei or anybody that's over there with her. And now you're now you're um, queen, you know, but I, I don't know, man, that that that's that's weirdness. Like, I, I understand Daenerys has shown signs of being a little bit cruel before, but it was always cruelty towards like bad people like slave traders and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. Like the first time I was jarred, I, it, it hit me. I was like, whoa, OK, bitch lost her mind. But I loved visually watching it. I was like, holy. F- I don't think I've ever oh, seen no. Yeah, visually, even season eight is a masterpiece. Like, like trust me, they didn't drop acting wise. Um, the way the um the season looked, like all of that, it's all there. The only thing that messed up really was just the plot. Yeah, I think we were spoiled. Like watching yeah, it back. Yeah, that's a fact. Yeah, they set the bar so high, you know. And like, um, t- compared to other shows, season eight isn't really that bad. Yeah, you know, but they set the bar so high, like it, it was it was a letdown. A hundred percent. All right, we're on the same page over there. I mean, I'm in I'm in the minority because I understand a lot of people don't like the sped up whole thing. But you know, watching it back, I was so into it. I was just like, let's trim the fat and just kill everybody. I loved not, it. Not now that we're on, now that we're on the subject, they messed up, Jamie. <laughs> Yeah. Man, I was like, man, come on, yo! It's like one of the greatest scenes in in TV history was Jamie um in the in the hot tub, and he was like, oh, my name is Jamie, my name is Jamie. When he was explaining to Brienne about why he killed the Mad King, you know, mm-hmm. he was like, I saved 
everybody that lives in King's Landing because I didn't want him to blow up everybody. And then as, in season eight, he's like, I don't care about anybody except me and my sister. Yeah. I'm like, no. <laughs> it's like your whole origin is because you're caring about people, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. like you, you lost your honor for caring about everybody in the in the, in the the city. It's like, oh, man, man, that's such a letdown. And then, and then he, he destroyed my girl, Brienne. Brienne's like one of my favorite characters on there. Like, he hit her with the one night stand and then get, <laughs> give her the deuces, you know? I was like, man, come on, Jamie. <laughs> when, when they had that intimate moment and I watched it back with my wife, I, we were we just started laughing. I was like, oh, boy, man, this is, this is turned this into some mess. Yeah. Hey, a, a good scene from season eight though was when Brienne got knighted. I was like, that was cool. That was super oh. cool. Yeah, the the night before that battle, um, it, that the whole that whole like sh uh, episode was fantastic to me because it was just that build up, right? Like everyone was just kind of like, okay, here's where my mind's at. Here's what you just kind of got. And then you had the night battle. Everyone complained that it was so fucking dark. Did it bother you? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think it, it depends what you watched it on because um on my TV it was it was dark, but then when I watched it like on my phone it wasn't um it wasn't a problem. I guess because I could like brighten up my phone, mm -hmm. so it wasn't a problem watching on the phone. But on the TV it was definitely dark. But you see, th this is a problem with season eight. Every time you remember something cool, they remember something not cool. You know, <laughs> like, something, like something out, completely out of the way. Beric Dondarrion. Yeah. He, di he died and came back six times. You're like, okay, there has to be a reason for him to keep coming back. And then he just dies in the library. I'm like, <laughs> why did he keep coming back? It's like, there, there was literally nothing. Like, I was like, why do y'all keep bringing this guy back? Okay, he's going to do something cool. I thought maybe he was going to give up his life to bring somebody else back to life. He literally just died in the library. Like, I was like, what the hell? And then Arya kills the Night King. Why Arya? <laughs> <laughs> Out of everybody, y'all could have been. Why are you? Like, where's the connection? You know, it's funny. I was in a minority with this too. I'm. I, I love bad guys. I like. I like the good guys dying. I'm a weirdo like that. When and by the way, if you're just jumping in, we're talking Game of Thrones. If you haven't seen it, tune out. Come back in a couple <laughs> they, of minutes. They, they tune in to hear about UFC 280. They, <laughs> they, show, they showed up. And these guys are talking about Game of Thrones. <laughs> Welcome to the MMA holes. <laughs> uh, clickbait, baby. Uh, so, I. I, I love. I loved, I loved when John got stabbed. I love yes. I love that. I was like, oh shit. And everyone was freaking out on the internet saying, oh my God, you killed the best character, blah, 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 blah. Oh, that, made, that made sense. That made sense story-wise because it was a consequence for a decision. If he were to stay dead, would it would it have like completely turned you off to the show? Oh, I, okay, okay. I that that one's a little tricky because I it, it made perfect sense for him to get stabbed and um for them to turn on him, but I also wasn't mad about them bringing him back. I've okay. always said in the show, the the um the Lord of Light was definitely those were my guys. You know, <laughs> I was like mm -hmm. in the in the show there was always um everybody's always like flaky on who they believed in like they had the seven the old gods the lord of light the faceless man and i've always told everybody i was like if i was in that world i would definitely be with the lord of light people because although the faceless man you see them like doing their little tricks changing their faces i know whenever barrack and the brotherhood of banner do this it lights on fire <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so no matter how how doubtful you are you're like i know that shit works every single time they never not did this and it didn't work you know mm, yeah <laughs> every time they did it, this one lights on fire i was like the lord of light has to be real and then when they show barrett come back to life i was like oh that's the guy <laughs> it's like the lord of light's the guy that's in charge you know so them bringing john back to life too i was like yeah i mean you've already proven that the Lord of Light has something going for her. We saw um, the Red Witch give birth to the the zombie um, skeleton black man. I was like, all right, it all makes sense. So I I, I wouldn't have if John didn't come back, it would have been weird because now we're we're stuck with um um Sansa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I don't I don't think Sansa could have carried that show on her own. I hated Sansa. I I even to the, even rewatching it, I'm like, kill this bitch. Like she just had the face where you just wanted to slap. Like horrible things happened to her, and I was rooting for the bad guys. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I I think she paid she paid for she paid for um the, her first like two seasons. You know, yeah. like but the the amount of bad things that happened to to her, I was like, all right, man, I forgive you. The same thing with um um Theon. 
Mm-hmm. Like Theon, I was like, man, this guy has it bad. <laughs> like, like Theon definitely paid for everything he did. Talk about like a, an arc with that guy, right? Like a full circle. Like that's crazy. His storyline is is bonkers. When you watch it back too, like binge through, you're like, holy fuck, this guy's been through so much shit. So much, yeah. Like people don't really like he he has a whole show on his own, you know. Mm-hmm. But the, the the whole the whole cause of it was his fault, you know. Yeah. But but then at the same time, like when you when I rewatch it, when I was binge watching, I was like, I could kind of understand his point, especially when he gave the speech about, um, do you know what it feels like when people are, are telling you you're lucky to be um kidnapped by an honorable guy? It's like, I don't care how honorable he is, like he's still like kidnapped me, you know? Mm-hmm. But at the, but on the other side, it's like, you could have had a lot worse. Like Ned kind of raised him as his own son, you know? Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> it's so funny when, when he came to take over Winterfell and then Bran is just so confused. He's like, wait, you live here. <laughs> like, what do you mean? You're coming to take over? You, you live with us. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so, it's such a, it's a weird, it's a weird, the whole thing, like every direction that they went in was wild. I tell you, re- I liked it better the second time than the first. I loved it the first, but the second time was even better. Knowing what happens and then saying, oh shit, this leads to that. Like it's, yes. it's so good. So I, I won't spend the whole show. I could, but um, House of the Dragon. Okay. I, I'm going to tell you what I think real quick. My wife loves it. She is just, she is so all in on House of the Dragon. She loves it. I feel like my expectations are so high. My biggest problem with the show is the time jump is just so extreme that I can't get invested in anybody. That's that's my problem with it. Uh, but. I, I think I think because I kind of already knew the story, the time jumps aren't... Um, it's not a big deal for me because in my mind, I'm kind of waiting. I'm like, mm-hmm. all right, hurry up and get to this. Hurry up and get to this. Hurry up and get to this. So I don't, man, I don't mind House of Dragon at all. And even some of the stuff that I already knew, they're kind of like putting a twist on it in certain ways where like you're still getting caught off guard. You're still getting surprised, man. I, I like I like what they're doing with that show. I'm so, like, it, it went by so fast. I feel like they just started like last week or something. And now it's about to be over next week. And are you caught up? You're completely caught up, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, nah, trust me. I tune in every, every Sunday. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So I'm not going to... All right. I, I don't I'm trying to want to do this without a spoiler because this is a new show. But um, the scene where someone comes out of the floor, what did you think about <laughs> at, oh, at, man, last night? I thought, I, thought, I thought that was badass. The only thing I didn't like was her not attacking. Mm-hmm. Like, that's me try, trying not to um, spoil it, too. But, like, after she comes out of the floor, it's like, you've already caused so much trouble already. It's like, well, why don't you why don't you just hit them, <laughs> hit them where it hurts? You know, like, everybody that could possibly be a threat to you in the future is right there in front of you. Yeah. Do something. You know? It's like, you can't just leave. But she's such a badass, too. You know, like, I, I kind of let it go. And, like, the... um. You know, after the show, the the directors and producers always like talk. They said she didn't want to do it because she saw another mother protecting her their, her kids. So I was like, okay, I guess I can understand that. But boy, is she gonna pay for that? <laughs> She's gonna pay for that mistake later. <laughs> yeah, you know, watching Game of Thrones again, I started seeing the little things with the Targaryens, like who kills who and stuff. I was like, holy shit, I completely missed that the first time around. Yeah. There's like legit spoilers in Game of Thrones if you watch that yeah, back. If you listen, um. In Game of Thrones, Arya talks about everything. Like she kind of talked about the whole story. Um, Joffrey talks about the whole story. Mm-hmm. A lot of them kind of already tell you what's gonna happen in, in this show. I tell you what, Sadiq, I need to have a regular segment just talking about. Do you like any other TV shows? Like, what's your favorite TV show of all time? And right, well, right now, to be honest, it is it is Game of Thrones right now. Okay. Like, uh, there's not a lot that I I really tune in for like all the time. But th- these days is just only Game of Thrones. I try to watch um the new um Lord of the Rings prequel, but I'm not gonna lie, it's 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 hard to it's hard to really keep up with. Yeah, I I, I 15 minutes and I turned it right off. I was like, yep, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> we don't you know, have time. You know, like for me, um, I don't know if you're a big like Marvel guy, but I was watching um She Hulk, and, oh. and, and like I was I was iffy on it, and then there was one episode when they started they mentioned the name Meg the Stallion. And I was like, all right, where are we going with this? And then at the end of the episode, it turns into She-Hulk and Meg the Stallion twerking. I was like, all right, I'm out. <laughs> I think that's that's my key to leave. I avoided that show like the plague. I, I'm so afraid of that show. Like, I don't know. The trailer looked ter- terrible to me. So I was like, I don't I don't know. So you're saying yeah. it's no good. I thought I thought it was going to be all right. You know, it was kind of it was always like, OK, it's not that bad. It's not good. 
but it's not mm. that bad. And then when they started twerking, I was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not twerking on TikTok? You're you're keeping it professional? No, no, not, not at all. <laughs> not, not at all. I don't. Funny enough, on TikTok, um, I had, I had like a like a month where everything I posted on there went viral, and then they they um they shadow banned me. Cause I I kept on putting like fights and stuff like that on there. There was like um I was glorifying violence and stuff. So they they shadow banned me to where like I would go live. I'll go live before and there'll be like five thousand people on there. And I, whenever I go live now, it'll be like maybe like a couple hundred. So when they shadow banned me, I had one of the UFC people call them to like try to fix it. And it was like <laughs> they're not gonna fix it until I start getting on there and like dancing. Like I gotta start like making real TikToks. <laughs> they actually said that. Yeah, yeah, because they said, um, because, um, I, I post, like, just funny videos from all around. There was, like, they need me to, like, be making, like, content that makes sense for TikTok for oh, them okay. to unshadow ban me. I was like, I'm sorry. I don't think I'm going to be dancing anytime soon. <laughs> so, basically, like, what Derek Lewis does on Instagram where he's showing the crazy stuff? Exactly. exactly. Gotcha, gotcha. So, now, here, you, look at you, man. You're the UFC fighter over here. You're, you're, you're a ranked fighter. And uh, you're coming off this big win, 30 seconds. Like, how does it feel to be at this situation, this stage of the game? I mean, one second you're in the contender series. Next thing you know, now you're like a UFC veteran over here. And you're coming off a big, quick victory. How does it feel right now? Yeah, to be honest, this this was kind of the path that I always saw my career going, you know? It's like once I got the Contender Series contract, my goal was just to now show that I could compete with everybody that was in the UFC. And in my first two fights, I kind of showed that. Then the goal was to become ranked. And now the goal is to just get past that top – um, get through that top 10, you know, just to get into single digits. There's always one one step at a time, one step at a time, so I can work my way to that title. Mm-hmm. The, the thing is, I think – when I was a kid, I always said, hey, one day I'm going to fight in the UFC. One day I'm going to fight in the UFC. But once I achieved that, then I was like, all right, <laughs> now I got to set new goals. And in this stage of the game, everybody is so good. Your goal can't be so far ahead that you're not planning for each individual. So at this point now, I just plan for each individual fights. Whenever they give me the name, I'm fully locked into that person. I, I saw someone on Twitter, and I wish I remember which fighter it was. <clears throat> but they said, and and and... I don't know. It doesn't seem right, but I'm going to ask you. They say it's easy to get into the UFC. It's a matter of what you do when you're in the UFC. Like now with the Contender Series, guys with like three or four fights, pro fights, are getting contracts. Do you feel that's the case right now? Uh, I. So I feel like when people say that, it's kind of like is is like them trying to like shit on shit on the new guys, you know. So I, I, I understand what he's trying to say, but I would never say it's easy to get into the UFC. I don't think it was easy for me to get into the UFC. So um, now that whoever wrote that is probably somebody that's been in the UFC for a while and they're seeing other guys come up with an easier path than they had. Just because mm-hmm. their path might seem like more streamlined doesn't necessarily make it easy. Mm-hmm. Because I'm surrounded by fighters at the gym that are trying to get into the UFC that's just not making it happen, you know. But I will agree with the fact about how hard it is to stay in, you know. I think the average UFC career is like three, four fights, and then they're out, you know. So it's, it's definitely hard to stay in the UFC. It's hard to keep your ranking. It's hard to um, keep the belt. Like, no matter what it is, the ho- the better you do, the harder it becomes. That's, that's, just, a, that's just a game of life in general. So I, I, I would have to disagree with what he said. It's it's cra- crazy right now because <clears throat> you were supposed to fight. Weren't they supposed to make the fight with Giga Chikadze? Was that something that was actually real? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, it was it was signed and everything. We um the fight didn't get canceled until um I think like a a week and like two days before before the the actual fight date. That's when it got canceled. And we we didn't really. I think they said it was like some injury, something bad, like something pretty serious. They didn't give us much detail about it, but I know it was serious enough for where the UFC didn't want to postpone it, like mm-hmm. that because we asked to move it down a couple of weeks, you know, and they didn't want to postpone it. Okay, so now and and then now I'm hearing the rumblings of like perhaps they're doing a, a Korea card or something like that where they would have the Korean Zombie on there, and and perhaps your your name is thrown into the mix. How real is that? Yeah, yeah, man. I, I hope, <laughs> I hope it's very real. You yeah, because that that's that's what I asked for. Like that's why I, I called him out. Um, after my fight, you know, because I, I I need an opportunity for me to get the spotlight. I've I've had some pretty good spots on on cards before, but I feel like that would be the opportunity for me to finally get a main event spot. 
Mm-hmm. And he's sitting at number six right now. You're sitting at number twelve. So yeah, I mean, that 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 would be a great career move for holy, me. That'd be something else. So what a main event fight against the Korean Zombie in in, in Korea. I mean, that would that not be wild? <laughs> and and it'll be as it'll be exactly what I asked for. You know, yeah. you got you got You got Um, in this game, you got you got to take chances. You got to take chances. So I was, I was, I was undefeated as an amateur. And then I was five and zero oh as a pro, and they gave me um, the call to go on the Ultimate Fighter, the undefeated season. And I remember um, we we all got together, me and my coaches, my manager, and it was like, man, we don't want to do that because we don't want to be locked into an Ultimate Fighter contract, you know? Like even even if I win, you will still be locked into the winner's contract for the Ultimate Fighter, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, we got we we got to try to get into the UFC a different way. Either we get called straight in or something else so instead of taking that instead of taking that opportunity i went and go i went to go fight for the titan fc belt and then i had my first career loss you know it's like it was one of those things you take you take chances sometimes it works out sometimes it don't yeah I had my first career loss now i get a call from brave fc they're calling me to come lose to like some conor mcgregor kid that they're that they're hyping up i was like hey it's another opportunity you know if you could beat this guy you get to take a little bit of a shine I, I went to Brave. I, I won that fight, I think, in like 20, 40, 40 seconds or something like that. And then I got a call for the contender to fight Mike Davis. Another fight that was a big, um, well, they thought it was a, <laughs> I, I, I was going to lose. I was like three to one underdog for that fight, too. Mm-hmm. But opportunities are opportunities, you know. I take that fight. I win. We had a great showing. And now we're in the UFC. It's- so that's why I'm saying, like, when they talk about, getting to the ufc is easy i don't think so you know it's like you got you you got to take some risks to get to the ufc um so getting staying in the ufc is definitely definitely more difficult but it is what it is this sport is all about taking chances and it's the same thing i'm calling out the korean zombie going to go fight in korea hey it's a main event opportunity you know there's a good chance for you to increase your shine in the, in the organization yeah, I mean, you've been on a, a, a couple of pay-per-view cards uh, since you got into the UFC. You've fought during the uh, the uh, whole COVID situation. You, you pay, basically did it all. Only one blemish on your resume, and and all these wins over here. I mean, you're in play. Like you're you're a big player. You're kind of you're kind of like the dark horse right now, right? Yeah, that's a fact, man. I feel like, um, to be honest, I actually didn't fight during the COVID stuff. I got very, very sick during the during the um, pandemic. I, I was out for a long, long time. I, I I almost retired during the pandemic. So, so the so Andre Feely was was that the uh, fight? No, Andre Andre Feely was before the, the pandemic. That was um. I think that was on a McGregor card. Yeah, McGregor or, Cerrone. Yeah. So 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 you fought him, and then after that, you got sick. You're saying? Yeah, yeah. So after so after I fought Andre Philly, I I I got COVID right before the Arnold Allen fight. Okay. But I I, I, re- I recovered, and after after I recovered from the um from the COVID, we fought. So I I never I I don't like talking about that it, with with the fight because I don't want to make it seem like that had anything to do with the fight. Like I was completely fine fighting Arnold, but when I came back from the Arnold fight. I just I, I kept on having these like like weird symptoms from when I had COVID before. Hmm. And I, I and it was one of those things where I, I didn't know if I was unmotivated because I just lost. I didn't know if I my body was feeling weird because I was eating bad or something like that. So my my thought process as an athlete was to just train through it, you know, push through. Not knowing that was the worst thing I could have done, and I, it just kept on getting worse and worse and worse to where like I would just get tired, like trying to like walk up the steps. I'll I'll be um I'll be re- relaxing, and next thing you know, I'm talking to my friends, and now I just feel sleepy, and not sleepy like tired, like sleepy as in like I'm gonna fall asleep right here, you know. Mm-hmm. And I would have like terrible headaches, terrible headaches, and my body would start getting cold, and I didn't know what was going on for a while. So like I said, I would just try to train through it. If you go through my Instagram around that time, you'll see me like do, like running, making these videos because that's what I was trying to do, like to um, motivate myself. Like I was just going these long runs. I was like, OK, I, I don't feel good training. Let me go on these long ass runs. I didn't know this was just compiling like what was going on with me. And I didn't know. So I talked to our team doctor and he was working with a, a girl that that's um, on the Olympic team for track. Mm-hmm. And he was like, man, the stuff you're telling me sounds like a lot of the stuff that this girl keeps um, that this girl is going through. And it was like, yeah, um, she's suffering from long haul symptoms from COVID. I didn't even know that was a thing. You know, I'm freaking 20, 27, 28 at the time. You know, I'm a damn UFC fighter. You know, yeah. <laughs> like everybody, everybody on our team that got COVID at the time, like it, 
they had like a cold and was okay the next time. So it was like, man, this sound like long haul syndrome of COVID. And then when they started doing like blood tests and stuff like that, there was like your body's acting like you're fighting off a virus. It was like like my lymph nodes or something like that was like going crazy. Like my body was still still reacting like I had a virus, even though I was perfectly fine. You know, so it was one of those things where I had to take a long time off of training. Those like you got to stop training, like literally right now. Like all all those like runs and all that stuff, you got to stop right now. I was out of the gym for about, I'll say like three three four months after after the Arnold fight, and then after that, I'll slowly try to like work my way back in. And it was one of those things where like I, it, it wasn't like a straight line towards being okay again. Mm-hmm. I would I would um I would go to the gym. I'll train maybe once or twice a week, and if it's if it's good, I'll train again the next day, and then I'll probably crash. So I was just slowly building up like that until it got to a point where I could train three times a week, then I could train four times a week, then I could train the whole week, and then I have to take a couple of days off, and then slowly, slowly but surely, it started it started going away. I just I had to like really take the time to actually rest. And luckily for me, um, I was able to come back because when I started going through all that stuff, I started joining a bunch of groups online that. Well, people that was suffering through the same things, and there were some people that I haven't checked back in a while, but there were some people that were like still going through it like f- for a whole year. Like mine was about a few months, but like the girl that ran track for my um for our team doctor, like she was she was she she sat out for about like a year and a half, you know. Hmm. So it was one of those things. Like when it was all going on, I didn't know what was happening. I I called my coach. I was like, man. I, I think I might be done. Like, I, I don't know what's going on in my body. We might have to retire, blah, blah, blah. But I'm happy at least I, I got to figure out what it was. The, that whole COVID nonsense was like, man, that, that stuff was... To this day, I think we're going to have to figure out what was really going on. Because the second time I caught COVID, I was completely fine. Wow. <laughs> you know, like, nothing happened to me. Yeah. So I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what was going on. It, it's funny because just by you telling that story, the first person I thought of was Amanda Nunes. When she fought uh, Pena the first time, that was right after she was having those COVID problems, and she lost. And she didn't look like herself. Like, she looked like she was exhausted. She was huffing and puffing. People were saying that she didn't take it serious, that, that, that fight. But I don't know. There was, there was something off on that. And then the, the, the next fight afterwards, she just ran over Pena. So yeah. I, I'm to wondering. To be honest, like, around the same time, this is one of the things people don't talk about enough. Um, Cody had really bad COVID, too. You know, where um, he, he said he was, like, coughing up blood and stuff like that. Luckily enough for me, nothing really happened with my lungs. Mm-hmm. All, all, all my Like, that's why I, I was still able to do those runs forever. All yeah. my stuff was just, like, I would, the worst part of it was literally just the fatigue. Like, I would just be talking. I would be talking to people. And next thing you know, it's like, I have to, like, fall asleep, like, right there where, where I'm at, you know? And, like, I will get winded, like, going up the steps. But it wasn't like my lungs wasn't hurting or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Like, I could, I could still train be perfectly okay. When I came back. Now, then it was hard. I, man, I, I, I cried on the mats a few times, you know, because wow. I like my coach was putting me against like like white belts and stuff like that to um just just to get me going. You know, I, I can only do like about like four minutes around, you know, or like maybe a three minute rounds. And then I'm getting beat up by white. Belt. Wow. <laughs> yeah, by like, white belts and stuff like that, you know, it was very, very demoralizing. So you were were you really contemplating like, hey, man, I think this is it. Like, I, I can't. Yeah, bounce yeah. Back? No, it, it's, because I didn't know what was going on when they told me what it was. Then then everything was okay then i was like oh okay i just i literally need to just stop training just be a regular guy hmm. but when i didn't know what was going on you know this is a dangerous sport you don't know what's going like i don't want to be one of these guys that like i didn't know if it was like cte or something like that it's one of those things like you don't want to think about but it's always in the back of everybody's everybody's mind and you guys might know might not know my personal story like that but my, i've had two brothers pass away already in, in my family so it's one of those things where i'm like man I, I don't I don't want to be next, you know. It's like my mom is freaking out and stuff like that, like because she would see me. I, I I bought a house right before the pandemic, and I moved my mom with me, so she would see me like going home and coming back from practice. And then when she realized I wasn't going anymore, because I didn't want to tell her, you know, <laughs> I didn't yeah. tell her. I see you like just sitting at home, and like I finally like had to tell him the truth, and like it was so obvious, you know, because like. I would just be dragging around around the house. You could tell there was something wrong. So mm-hmm. it was it was one of those things. It was it was very very scary times. I'm glad I'm glad it's behind me now. I bet. And and by the way, I see your beautiful mom over here on Instagram. She's dancing away. It looks like she makes her own clothing. Is that what she does? 
Yeah, yeah. So my my sister actually makes most of those clothes, and like she sends them from Nigeria to my mom, and my mom sells them. You know, it's just something that she does on the side. Like I really want her to retire. You know, so she she's um she wants to work for herself. Like she still has a regular job now, but God willing, one day I'll be able to retire her. Uh, that's the man. What an awesome story. So you see, your brother is in. I I just I'll dabble into it just a little bit here, if you don't mind me asking. How did they pass? Yeah, so the first one, he died from malaria. And that was literally before my UFC debut. Like, if you, um, my UFC debut was, man, that was a, that was a hell of a story, too. Because the week before I flew out to Australia, I fought Sumal Maktarian. The week before I flew out to Australia, uh, damn, how did I find out? Oh, I got a call. I got a call from my sister in Nigeria. And she, she, she was just, like, talking to me about, um, somebody's um um it's like my brother is finally gone like they're gonna take him off life support listen this is me not knowing anything like i'm just oh. like i'm chilling and she was like okay they're gonna he she called me she was like hey they're gonna take um junior off life support but blah, blah. i'm like they're gonna do what it's like uh yeah they're gonna take him off life support so i'm still confused at this time my mom i didn't um, my mom didn't move in with me yet she still lived in an apartment so then i went over to go visit her and like she's surrounded by a bunch of like um family friends and stuff and my brother and like they're crying and stuff like that i didn't know my brother was sick that apparently he'd been in the hospital for like a few days before before um they called me and my mom was like yeah we know you're about to make your ufc debut we didn't want to distract um we didn't want to distract you from the fight like we didn't want you to be sad blah blah, blah, blah. and then i was like yeah but um now he's passed away i was like damn like it's a tricky situation because you have to you have to kind of like keep that stuff bottled up because at the end of the day I still I don't want it to affect my um my debut but the fact that they hid it from me have affected me more than I feel like if they so I don't know hindsight like I don't know you know you go it's hindsight it's 2020 you never you never know yeah. but them trying to hide it from me I feel like was even <laughs> was even more jarring you know because I was like damn like now instead of like like grieving like they're thinking about me fighting, you know. Mm-hmm. So I didn't um like it was very rough. After my after my debut, like as soon as I got in the um back back room, I just like bawled out crying back there because I, I, I just kept it all bottled up, you know. Nobody really knew. I told like my coach. I told I told I, I think I told like two of my coaches and that that was about it because wow. they they caught me crying when on the treadmill one time. So I told them what was going on and that after that it's just you got to try to ignore it, act like it's not going on. And then the sec- my second brother, he passed away not long after that from from drugs, you know. So it's it's one of those things is it, it's it's rough. It's rough. And to be honest, I haven't been back to Nigeria since my second brother passed. Mm-hmm. And th- that's because he's the one that always picked us up from the airport. Mm-hmm. And it was one it was one of those things where um it took a while. Me, me, my brother, my mom, we used to always go back to Nigeria all the time. And we didn't go for almost after my brother passed, we didn't go for about about a year and i remember i was talking to um i was talking to one of my friends i was like man my my mom hasn't brought up going to nigeria in a long time i feel like i feel like um she's still having a hard time with um my my other brother passing and then one day she was like hey sadiq i think i think i think it's time for us to go back to nigeria and then when she said it i got to fucking stuttering and shit you know so like when i started stuttering and then when when that's when i realized i was like Oh shit! I have a problem. You know, oh it's like it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, ju- it's not just her. So I, she's been back twice. I still haven't been back to Nigeria. It's one of those things I like. Fuck. It's like I, I, I am. I, it, it's it was a little bit hard to to face the truth. Sometimes you could kind of pretend like okay, um, um, they're still back home. You mm-hmm. know, you could you go you could always kind of like trick yourself like they're still back home, even though you know they're not. You know, but the next time you go back, it's gonna be such a weird reality. Yeah. You know, because because now now the people are gone, That's, but it's definitely it's definitely something I have to face in the future. Yeah, eventually. Right. It's going to be so tough to do. And I, I bet the longer you wait, the probably the tougher it's going to be, you know, like I, oh, I, I said I was going to go after this fight. But here I am again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny you're bringing up Nigeria. And I think of a, a friend of the show, uh, Will Harris, uh, Anatomy of a Fighter over there. Yes. Have you, I, he went with Kamaru Usman and did that whole documentary in Nigeria. Do you get a chance to check that out? No, I haven't, I haven't watched it. I haven't watched it. Oh, okay. It's 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 fascinating. It really is. It really like it shows Kamaro going over there and and he's you know trying to get you know 
MMA in Nigeria because you got so much talent over there, but it's just not like not like over here. And these athletes that they were showing in, in like their little section of the world, I mean, holy crap, you guys, you're like a different breed. Like <laughs> it is wild. I've always said, especially like Nigerians, like it's such a hustle, hustle, like struggle kind of culture, you know, where like th those kind of people, all they need now is just the knowledge behind the techniques, you mm -hmm. know, because that's really what MMA is at the end of the day is just dealing with adversity. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was, I've never, especially coming up, I was never the best guy in the room, but I always feel like I had the best work ethic in the room. You know, I was I was always a good um a good nail, which is something I took pride in. You know, everybody's a good hammer, not everybody's a good nail, and that that doesn't mean I'm happy getting fucked up. It just means <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 able to deal with the struggle. You know, that's why I always say like my people are built for struggle. And I feel like that's something that that um resonates with not even just Nigerians in general, but just immigrants. You know, mm -hmm. especially um immigrants that that travel to a different country where they see like oh there's value here it's harder for people that are born in certain places to see the value because you're surrounded by it your whole life it's not your fault yeah but when you come from somewhere else that doesn't have as much resources you, you're able to see the value better you know just watching back some of your previous fights and the situations you get yourself in and then right out like it's it's pretty wild that's, that's what i'm talking about yeah. man we're built for struggle <laughs> <laughs> it's just, but it's that's that's what i mean by being a good nail i faced i faced those scenarios before in the gym you know mm -hmm. so when, whenever those th when those type of things happen during the fight i'm not gonna crumble yeah. you know i remember um when when Arnold caught me with a head kick, it, it was bad. Like it, it hurt me bad. But I was like, I was like, literally just talking to myself. I was like, come on, come on, don't go out, don't go out, don't go out, don't go out. Like just talking to myself, trying trying to scramble back to my feet, you know. But that that's what I mean. Like that's 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 fighting. That's life. Mm -hmm. What is like a situation like that? Was that the 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 craziest situation you've been in with that head kick? Like like yeah. what was the yeah, worst situation? It's probably the most the the most hurt I've been in a fight for sure. And what is it like? Is it like ringing? Does the room kind of close yeah. in? Yeah, because everything's like this. Like, you know, like if you, when you're holding a camera, <laughs> when you're holding a camera <laughs> and things just start moving like that, that's exactly what it is. Like, you're, like you, you feel the ringing for sure. But the thing with his was that I was still on my feet, mm -hmm. but the equilibrium was so off that like now you're like you're trying to like <laughs> you're trying to that's balance crazy. yourself and in the middle of that balance is like now we're just scrambling trying to like wrestle myself back up and that was on the that was on the abc card too right that was yep. ufc on okay so i was on the abc card they were wearing the funky jackets and stuff like that uh, <laughs> so so i mean do you hear your corners in that situation does it when it sh shakes off or is it just like on autopilot after that how it's happening you, um no i didn't hear my corners but when i was able to separate then i heard my corner side yelling circle 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 and that, that that's what um, bought me some time what fight would you say you felt like you were the most in the zone like you you felt it's unbeatable all, that, that, definitely the mike davis fight okay mike that, davis. Definitely the mike davis fight because um i felt like that was the most at that time that was the most comfortable i've ever felt in a fight Mm -hmm. Because I um they gave us a perfect scenario. That was early, early contender series. That was the season two. That mm -hmm. was before um the the only people in the audience was really really just friends and family. You could hear everybody. Uh, you could hear a damn pin drop in that room, you know. And like it, it kind of it, it simulated sparring. It was mm -hmm. it basically was sparring without headgear, you know. Yeah. It was sparring with more consequences, <laughs> basically. <laughs> So I feel like that was the most comf comfortable I've ever been. So out of but being in this being in the zone, to be honest, I feel like almost all my fights, all the way to Arnold Allen, I've always fought in the zone. And the reason why I said that is on that loss, I took a big lesson from it. Is um, I have to learn how to get out of being in the zone. Mm -hmm. And what I mean, if you go back and watch that fight. I was down two rounds. In the third round, I never made a conscious decision to try to finish the fight. In my mind, I was still trying to win a round. Like, if you watch that fight, you see me holding him against the fence, doing stuff like that, still trying to win the next round, where no matter what, that wasn't going to win me the fight, you know? Gotcha. So when I went back and rewatched the tape, I realized I was like, um, no matter how good you are, these guys that you're going to be facing now are so good where you have to make conscious decisions in there. You know, I feel like that's what separates the champions from the rest of us. So I started talking to like sports, sports therapists and stuff like that and started working on it. 
while I was at practice on how to get out of being in the zone and start making decisions. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure a loss is not what you guys want and it's probably terrible the night of and you know just trying to bounce back from something like that. But in hindsight, now you got on a two fight win streak and you look back and by the way, Arnold Allen is all the way up there up top. So it's not like you lost to a bum or anything like that. Uh yeah, but but you, you you still want to catch out, you know. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but I do I do understand what you're saying. It's it's hard to learn from wins. Yeah. But it's you don't learn from losses, you're an idiot. <laughs> so he's on your hit list, Arnold Allen. You're like, I gotta get that back. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. You know, it's like so while before you before our rematch, I'm gonna wish him the best because the better he does, the 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 better my loss looks, you know? Yep. <laughs> but when we finally meet each other <laughs> I definitely, I definitely want that one back, you know. Do you think he Sean beats Arnold though? He's a he's a good guy. Guy, something else. Do you think he beats Cater? I don't know. I said um, I, a bunch of people asked me that in an interview. I said selfishly, I want to say yes because he beat me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but to be honest, however he does against Cater would let me know how the rest of us stack in the division, you know. And MMA math doesn't work. It doesn't make sense, but it does help out a little bit. I mean, I, I look at it like this. If I'm rooting, like I'm a baseball and football fan, whatever, if my team loses in the playoffs, I want the team they lost to to win the Super Bowl. Like, the Super Bowl. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's the same thing, right? I mean, you want you want Arnold Allen to be the champion, then you go up, you take his belt away and say, ha. Huh. I, I, I got to catch up, though. I got to catch up. So I, I hope he does good all the while until we, ca until we meet each other again. <laughs> What's the funniest thing that's ever happened inside an octagon or on the regional scene? Has Oh no, that that was an easy one. So I was fighting um I was fighting um Shaman Marias. And, and <laughs> I was fighting Shaman Marias and I, I threw I threw a leg kick and missed and I do this um th I like this move where like when you miss your leg kick you go with a side kick. Like you turn the leg kick into like a, a side kick. You step in, you miss the leg kick, you step in and throw a side kick. So I, I threw the leg kick and I missed. And I, I, I switched stances, I threw the side kick. And then I missed with the sidekick too. And then he laughed at me. And I remember in that split second, it hurt my feelings. <laughs> I remember I remember when he laughed, I was like, oh. <laughs> like, it went through my mind that like, oh man, he just laughed at me. He was laughing my <laughs> <laughs> like you know there's so much going on in, in fighting but I remember in that moment I was really hurt that he laughed at the move I worked so hard on <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, that's definitely one of the weirder things that's ever happened to me in a fight that's funny and in the UFC octagon it happened so 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 that what about trash talking and stuff like that have you ever had a guy be like like talk smack and you're like come on bro like did it ever get the guy that um they brought me in to fight the the Conor McGregor guy before I got into the UFC. He was a huge trash talker, you know. But I'm a, I'm a pretty stoic guy, you know. I don't um I don't really feed into that kind of stuff. But that's really been the only person that like was going hard on the trash talk. Most other people are, are really I'm. If, if you know the way I act, you know, and I feel like I've been to the UFC. Yeah, that, uh, the nuke. <laughs> the nuke, the nuke. Wow, what a face like, of um, that guy. teeth right here, you know, and he was just going crazy on me, man. He's like, I'm the fucking nuke. I'm the blah. And that was like at the height of Conor McGregor's um, like, like shine, you know. So I feel like a lot of people were trying to like replicate him. Mm -hmm. But outside of him, everybody else has always been cool, you know. I, I'm one of these. I look at this as a sport, you know. It's... It, uh, you have to do something wild for me to like hate you. You know, I I don't I don't, I don't give out that kind of energy, so I don't expect to receive it. Do you, Do you believe in pre-fight like getting into someone's head though? Whether it, you don't have to do trash talking, or I mean, some way is that a thing? I, I the only reason why I want to say no is because the moment I I hear I'm fighting somebody. You're not gonna get into my head any worse than that. Mm. <laughs> like I know these guys. I'm not one of these guys that's gonna lie to you about saying, "Oh, he's not in my head." Yeah. Every fighter I ever fought is in my head. <laughs> <laughs> they can't get in my head more. <laughs> it's like I think about them before I go to bed, and I think about them when I wake up. <laughs> it's like, it's like, they, it's like there's no like there's no more getting in my head. And so like if the goal of trash talking is to get in the fighter's head. I will happily tell you you've done that without trash talking. <laughs> so they're already <laughs> so, there. <laughs> so so is like maybe that's why I don't re like it doesn't resonate with me because I I've, I've always 
when I was coming up, George St. Pierre was my favorite um was my favorite fighter because I feel like he was always honest with what fighting really was. Even as a champion, he was very honest with what champ- fighting really was. He talked about being scared. He talked about um about his failures and successes and stuff like that. So now that I'm in a in a be- in a good position with the UFC, I try to be as honest as possible because you never know what little kid is listening to this interview and they're gonna be like, oh. I, I must I must be a, a bitch or I must be a bum. Maybe I'm not that good because um I'm I'm scared before my fights or something like that or or um my opponent is in my head. It's per- we're about to go fight in our underwear in front of millions of people. <laughs> <laughs> it's, per- it's perfectly okay to be scared. Your opponent is a trained assassin trying to fight you. Yes, they should be in your head. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you should be thinking about them. It's like it's like I don't understand this like um. I don't. I, it doesn't even make logical sense if you if you think about it honestly. It logically doesn't make sense. Why shouldn't the fighter be in your head when you're preparing for him? You have eight months. Mm. <laughs> I, I mean, I say eight months. You have eight weeks to, uh, and you're about to fight the guy. Yes, prepare for him. Like they, you should be thinking about what he does good, what he does bad. It's like so that that's. I I guess I guess the answer is yes yes trash talking gets fighters in your head but I thought it should have been in your head before the guy started trash talking. I I feel like that you're so comfortable with this. Did this come from sports therapy? Because I I feel like a lot of fighters aren't this comfortable with that thought. Well, to be honest, it's because it's because um there's a little bit of insecurity that comes with being a fighter in general. You know, you got to think about the mindset of somebody that wants to be a fighter. Mm-hmm. So it's like you have to have a certain amount of um. A certain amount of something in you that lets you not listen to other people and and lets you believe in yourself and say like okay I could do this no matter what, but at the same time too we're constantly in the gym being humbled from day one. Yeah. Unless if you've just been a badass your whole life, you walked in the gym and just started fucking everybody up. <laughs> it's like <laughs> like so with, with that, then you got to balance getting on being a famous fighter or getting to the UFC and now you have to be on camera and fake like that humbleness never happened. Like mm-hmm. when you was in the gym, like you like you wasn't getting your ass kicked in the gym before you became this good. The only reason you got this good is because somebody was fucking you up on, on your way up, you know, like or, or, unless if you was a badass on the get go, you know. Yeah. So I, the way I've always approached it is to be honest with myself from always be honest with myself. Of course, I wasn't very comfortable with um talking like this when i was coming up but the more success i have the easier it is for me to be honest you know yeah it's like i i feel like if you're still lying to yourself or trying to lie to the fans when you're a champion there's something there's something definitely wrong with that it's like you got you got to be honest about these things and i feel like life life is easier that way you know that's why i'm always chilling i'm always happy you know i feel like, Great. I feel like life life is a lot easier when you're honest yeah, I, man, I love the way you think. It's it's fantastic, and and being a role model, I could see how kids would be like, "Hey, I want to be like this guy." Like that's that's got to be great. No matter what you do with your career, you know, you probably inspired many many kids out there. Yeah, that that's the like I wouldn't say that's the goal, but I I would have I, I would appreciate that when it's all said and done. You know, mm-hmm. it's like okay, this guy did it the right way. It's like what I was in when I was in high school. I remember one of the older wrestlers. They told me. Um, Man, when when this when um wrestling is over or when the season is over and um you're about to graduate, you're gonna regret. You're gonna have regrets. You're gonna wish you did this, this, and this, this, and this. And I I remember when my last wrestling match, I was waiting for that feeling to come, but it never came. You know, it's like I was very very satisfied with how my career went because I know. I did everything I possibly could when I was in high school, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's the same mindset I kept, I brought into when I started doing mixed martial arts. It's like, give it your all so when, at the end of the day, you know, you have no regrets. That's a great way to think. When we had Ben Rothwell on, he spoke about the day of a fight, the miserable feeling of getting, or going to bed the night before and saying, fuck, <laughs> like, I gotta fight this guy tomorrow. Do you have that? Like, when you when you go so to that, bed? You... I, I, I think that's different for everybody. Okay. But, um, by the time the fight comes all for me i can only speak for myself i think it'll be different with everybody for me all that is gone okay all that is gone by the time the fight comes because you got to think about i go through i go through pretty intense training camps you know so like by the time the fight comes it's almost like thank god i'm about to fight tomorrow (laughs) you know so so after like when you're about a month out and you know, so day tomorrow at practice, I have to fight four different people, and they're gonna be switching in. Like that kind of stuff is like is 
is brutal. It's like it, wear, it wears on your mind. I, my coach always does this thing where he's always freaking surprising me with different training. And I hate it. I, I always tell him, I'm like, I hate surprises, but he won't stop doing it. But by the time the fight is there, I'm pretty I like I'm very, very confident. By, by that time, the time for being scared is, is done. That's what I always say to the younger fighters. By the time by the time it's time to fight. The time for being scared or worried is over. At that point, you're you're kind of a robot, which goes back to what I was saying about being in the zone thing, you know? Mm-hmm. That part of my career has always been easy. It's always been easy for me to lock in and, all right, this is what we're doing. There you go. And and do you do you dream about, like, I mean, now you're ranked. You're, you're getting closer and closer to this massive opportunity. Do you have, like, these dreams of throwing the belt over your shoulder, hopping on a plane, going to Nigeria, yeah. getting off, and the parade oh, starts? I mean- you know what's funny? I, 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 see, this is what I talk about being honest with yourself. I feel like a past self for me would just lie and said yes. Okay. But to be honest, it's like I, 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 I haven't had dreams like that. But when I was a kid, I used to have dreams about being in the UFC all the time. And the funny thing is, I used to have these vivid dreams of being in the UFC, where like it's not even me fighting. It'll be dreams of me in the hotel room like, <laughs> like getting ready for fight week like stuff like that like me running into jeremy stevens in the hotel room like trying not like trying not to like have conflict and stuff like that you know but um i i'm my whole like ufc career has always been me locked into the next guy you know i feel mm-hmm. like the belt's gonna come as long as i keep winning so it's always been me locked into the next guy locked in of course you um visualize like moments of glory like moments of um winning the belt one day but the dreams are always the dreams of the next fight and that's how i know when like the camp is starting to turn up when i start having dreams about the fight that i'm gonna have you know it's always it's either dreams about me fighting or nightmares of me missing weight <laughs> <laughs> so so oh, then I- I'll have nightmares where like I'm eating in the nightmare and then like I'll realize oh shit I'm supposed to fight and then I'll be like yo why did I just do that and then I, I'll miss weight like in my dream <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be miserable. Yeah, so, I mean, oh, my God. I couldn't imagine. So do you cut a ton of weight before each and every fight? Like, what's the, the, the amount that you have so to cut? I, I don't I don't cut a lot, but I do diet down pretty hard, you know? Okay. Like, by the time I cut, I, um, it's time for the weight cut. It's not, there's nothing crazy, you know? It's usually just the water weight is, it always gets done. I won't say it's easy, but I've never missed before. But that, the dieting down is is. The di- dying down is serious, and we're gonna keep that secret to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, what when you were a kid? So you didn't really dream about gold. You just wanted to be in the UFC. So, did yes. you dream about like rock star blowing hookers in the hotel room afterwards? No, like, what's going no, on? I, I've never been one of those guys, man. I'm telling you, I'm as square as they come. You know, I I, I don't drink, I don't smoke. You know, there's always just been like I was more like a, a like an anime nerd. You know, mm-hmm. like I was I really really liked anime. I liked the um the thought of training to become stronger and stuff like that. You know, I, I always had those type of, um, I, I always used to say I had, um, dang, what do they call it? What, um, delusions of grandeur, you okay. know, it's like, I've always had that since I was a kid, but that kind of, um, but also watching anime also made me see like, okay, it, it is possible to do. The first time I saw the awesome fighter, I thought those were, I was like, man, these guys are like real anime fighters. Like they're like real anime characters. Like they're training and becoming stronger. And it was something that I saw where I saw like, there's not a lot of things in life that you do where you could really, really affect the outcome on your own. Mm-hmm. I played football when I was in high school. I hated it. I hated it because I was surrounded by people whose work ethic was like so bad. And like we would lo- like winning or losing depends on the whole team. And that's when I realized I hated team sports. I was always, <laughs> I've, never, I've been a hard worker my whole life. So I was like. This then, if I go into it, it will be all dependent on me. Of course, it's outside circumstances and a lot of luck involved. But I could, I could move that luck in my direction in a good way, just based off how hard I work. That's why I like to gamble on UFC because it's only one versus one. You know, like with a team, so many things can go wrong. So, have you ever placed a bet on yourself? Hey, I'll tell you though, MMA is crazy, man. <laughs> MMA is crazy. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to gamble consistently on MMA. So many weird things could happen, yo. Like you were saying, Juliana Pena versus Amanda Nunes. You know, like MMA, MMA is crazy. Have you ever dropped a bet on yourself? Have you ever done that? No, no. So I and my and my coach has always been saying it, especially when I fought Mike Davis. That was like, man, you got to bet on yourself. You got to bet on a lot of people around me made so much money that day because I was I was a three to one underdog, you know. Mm-hmm. And like I remember somebody on freaking um on Instagram sent me a, a eighty eighty thousand dollar um like 
eighty no eighty two thousand dollar win. And like I was like, yo, this is crazy. But he's like a professional gambler, you know? Mm-hmm. And like he sent he sent me a picture of that. I was like, I, I are you gonna I are you gonna split that with me? He was like, No, but when you come to Vegas, I'll take you out to eat. <laughs> and, you don't um, want dinner, just so, give the money. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where I always felt like I never did it in the past. I don't want to do it now. Like it, it, it's not even necessarily like a jinx stand. It's just I I, I don't I, I like to just keep it the way it is. And what about relationship status? Are you with a girlfriend, a wife, or anything? Yeah, I'm, um, I have a I have a fiance now, and we, she's been with me throughout like my whole career. Like when I was in like a couple of my amateur fights, I think like my last three amateur fights and all the way to the pro level. So she's been seeing me grow from day one, like all the way to where we're at now. You know, it's funny. I noticed with a lot of the the top tier UFC fighters out there, they have a rock. They have they have that other half on the other side uh, that supports it's a, them. It's, a, it's important, man. It's important because a lot of a lot of people, um, not even just people, a lot of women won't they won't they don't understand what comes with this life, you know, mm. but the ones that are able to find somebody early and that woman is able to stay, stay um, consistent with you is hard to break that. You know, you, you value everything that they've done. The, Cause I, before she used to make the joke that she was like my weekend girlfriend, which was true. Cause I would spend the whole week literally training and I would see her maybe on a Saturday or a Sunday. And this was like, for like the first, like, two years of our relationship, you know, until I started getting a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more um, steady income going on, you know. So it's it's definitely, I I think it's important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we got uh, alerts coming in over here. I do want to get your thoughts on 280. We've been going for an hour, man. I love talking to you. You're the man. Hey, 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 remember when we tricked them and we started talking about Game of Thrones (laughs) instead? I tell you what, I could do a whole show on that shit. So if you ever want to come back and talk TV. I've been talking about Game of Thrones. I can't hear about UFC 280. (laughs) They're all tuning in like, what the fuck is this? Uh, Here's an alert from the chat. Uh, This is from D-Rest. Staten rules just like Sudik. Staten rules, so I guess Staten Island rules just like you, Sudik. What do you think about that? Oh, I, I I appreciate. It. I've never been to Staten Island before, but hey, if they rule, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> we got something else coming in here. This is oh, oh, we got a little song coming on here. Yeah, here we go. Come on, get loud, MMA holes in the crowd. <laughs> Come on, get loud, MMA holes in the crowd. Yo, but we're in the crowd. Hold on one second. Okay, this is from D Rest again. Super enough said. Super so that was in Australia. Uh there was an event happening and someone made our sign with a cardboard. <laughs> yeah. I just I don't know. Anyway, where was the I have a I have a funny story with Ally Quinta. Um this was like back when I was still like just a regular fan. And you I don't I don't know how long you've been watching MMA. Uh, he had like a real controversial win against um uh, against Jorge. Yeah, like real back in the day. And I remember I, that was one of like the first couple MMA fights I've ever. I mean, the UFC fights I've watched like in person. I was in the audience and like, and, and when he got the win, it was like boo boo boo, and then he turns and he literally stares at my section. <laughs> And like he's like, are you booing me? <laughs> and like I swear he was looking like it's funny he probably doesn't even notice. It was literally me and like two other guys behind me. He's <laughs> like, you booing me? I work my fucking ass off. I work my fucking ass. I was like, holy shit! I right, is about to fuck me up. <laughs> so if you go back and go watch that fight, the section he's yelling at is like me and like two white guys behind me. <laughs> so like, I wasn't booing as much as they was. <laughs> but, but I was in the vicinity. <laughs> oh my god! I remember that clear as day that fight. That was crazy. We had um a couple of his teammates come on the show too, and he was talking. They were talking about that. They said it was so loud in there, and his response was so funny. Did you think he won or did you think he lost? When I watched it in real life, I thought he lost. But when I watched it back on TV, I definitely thought he won. Like when you watch when you watch it back on TV, you could see how the judges gave him the fight. In real life, though. I uh, we we thought he um Jorge got robbed bad, but I remember that same week I watched it again on TV and I was like, oh, this is actually it wasn't actually that bad. Hmm. I gotta rewatch it because I remember in real time I thought they got it wrong too. But I I'm I'm a sucker for Al and anyone from Law MMA. We've we've uh, become friends with them over there. And well, speaking of Law MMA, Aljamain Sterling fighting at UFC 280, defending the belt. 
What are your thoughts yeah. on that? Oh man, I I I hope Al Jermaine gets that W, man. I I I will always pick against Delshaw. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I was doing an interview um yesterday, and I was like, if you find like my old interviews, you will see I was like the biggest Delshaw fan ever. I used to hype him up so 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 much, and then I found out he was a cheater, and and I turned into a scorned ex girlfriend. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I hope Ajman gets it done. It's funny. I had a bunch of people like that had other shows would message me and say, "Yo, this guy's on roids," and and they're like, "Look at his nipples," and and I was like, "No, no, not TJ." I I didn't. I refused to believe it. And then when it came I, out, as a fighter, um, like I think a lot of people looked up to him just because of like, um, his his rise up. He even beat one of like my like my teammates, um, um Mike Easton. Like this was back what before I was fighting. And I remember him beating Mike, and I even with that, I was like, man, I still, I'm still a big fan of this guy. You know, like his 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 pace in the fights, the way he carried himself in the fights. You know, I was a really really big fan. You know, so but like when he when they found out he was a cheater, I remember Cody almost um ratted him out and he's like, well, you taught all of us how to cheat. I was like, uh, Cody, you're snitching on yourself. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I, I remember after that, I was like. Ah, uh, you got you gotta write him off, man. This sport is very um is very dangerous, man. A lot of a lot of stuff a lot of stuff that you fans don't see or like the people that don't fight, you guys don't see it. Mm-hmm. And to to cheat in something like this is like it's pretty fucked up. Like I'm not gonna lie. I understand making mistakes, like I saw um what was going on with Bobby Green. Like that kind of stuff I completely understand. If you take something by accident or you just didn't know like this this is going on, but EPO is a whole different level of cheating. You know you're doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that's not reg- that's not regular cheating right there, you know. That's that's some that's some advanced level stuff right there. So I I also saw you got um you had a um the poster of um Deontay Wilder on here, and I remember him talking about wanting to kill somebody in the cage before, but the way he reacted to the loss um I mean not the loss the way he reacted to the press conference a couple of days uh yesterday is a whole completely different guy, you know. Yeah. And that comes from losing. You start seeing the consequences of what really goes on. The fact the fans don't see the the um the hospital visits and stuff like that, or the weeks of broken bones trying to heal, like seeing your family like headaches, little things like that, or they don't get to see the older fighters at the gym that's been through too many wars, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's that's kind of stuff that makes cheating in this sport so much more fucked up than any other sport. If you're taking steroids to hit a baseball faster, I, I couldn't care less. Yeah. <laughs> but, I... but if you're taking steroids and you're throwing spin kicks and blinding Michael Bisbin, it's like you're kinda of, like you're a different you're a different piece of shit, you know? Yeah, I don't blame you for not liking guys that that use that stuff. Uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned Bobby Green. We had a little fun with it. Like I feel bad for the guy, but at the same time he did a, a uh, an Instagram live or one of those live streams where he shows his cabinet and it was hilarious. It was just it's every <laughs> Yeah, it was every <laughs> pill that you could find. And I'm like, bro, what are you doing? Don't show that. <laughs> like he was just taking everything, just not like on purpose to cheat. It didn't seem like that yeah. at least. But it was just yeah. the, the cabinet was hilarious. Yeah, Sando, most most fighters, a lot of us like we do take like vitamins and supplements like that just because it's, it's a grueling sport, you know? Mm-hmm. But that's why I said I could kind of understand him. Like me, every time they send me something, I, um, I remember Jeff Nabinsky ran into me. He was like, hey, Sadiq, the man of a million questions. It's like, because that's kind of what you got to do. You mm-hmm. got you to gotta ask him a million questions because you never know, like, what could get you in trouble. That's why I don't, I, I don't blame anybody that accidentally takes something and they get in trouble for that. But you're not going to accidentally take EPO. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. I'm going to throw a couple of guys at you real quick. Um, give me a rapid fire answer. Do you think they're on steroids? Okay, ready? <laughs> <laughs> Conor McGregor. Well, he, he had he had a broken he had a broken leg. He had to be on steroids. I think they give you steroids for whenever you break a bone. So yeah, I was I'll say yes. Okay, all right, here we go. It's gonna be controversial right here. Israel Adesanya. I don't think so, man. I really don't think so. Just just because of one, his answer. I understand the the whole nipple gate thing looked really crazy, but his answer his. I think he would have gotten caught. I don't think um Izzy's one of these guys where the UFC loves him so much to where um they're gonna try like hide anything from him and like his. His response to it wasn't that bad either, so I don't I don't think he is. He's also not built. I understand it doesn't um it doesn't always work out like that, but 
I'm not very knowledgeable on steroids. I know like EPO and stuff that helps you for stamina, but I feel like the type of stuff that gives you like big nipples and stuff like that for like bodybuilding. But mm-hmm. correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean he's passed his USADA tests, all this stuff. Everyone, everyone doesn't like a winner, so they just keep on finding things. But the droopy fact, nipple, especially, especially with somebody like Izzy that um <laughs> that's like braggadocious. You yeah, know? yeah. All right, how, one more I'll give you, Kamaru Uzman. Oh, they, they be trying to kill Kamaru. You're asking the wrong Nigerian, you know? I'm going to say no to, no, no to all of them. <laughs> I, I'm with you, though. I've defended Kamaru. Izzy I had a little fun with because the nipple was like pizza hanging off of his chest, but I stopped with that. But Kamaru, I think, is clean. I, maybe I'm crazy. Like that since college. And to be honest, people don't want to believe it. I'll, I will show you m- many of my cousins that don't do anything that kind of look like Kamaru. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I believe that certain people just genetically have it. Like Chris Curtis, for some, for some he came on the show a couple of times, and he says he doesn't lift weights, and the dude's got an arm like the size of my head. I don't lift weights either, and people always think, people always think I lift weights. I, I've tried to lift weights one time, and I gained like <laughs> like six pounds in like two weeks. <laughs> so I was like, all right, let's put this down. So what do you do? A lot of conditioning and and all all conditioning, all conditioning and training. The um when I've had um like muscle imbalance problems, I'll work on like my hamstrings and stuff like that. But it's not really lifting weights. It's literally just doing physical therapy. Okay, there you go. We got a couple of more alerts over here. I'm gonna try to wrap this up here for you. We got the Joker wonderful, coming wonderful. in. Joker's got something to say. Hey, it's the Joker. What's up, Yusuf? Hello from Australia. Love Nigeria. Take care. Oh, uh, nice. I appreciate that, man. They showed me a lot of love when I fought in um in Adelaide, man. It was it was it was good times. There you go. And we got one more coming in over here. Ah, super chat. This is from Be Certain. My man just made a fan for life. Awesome interview. Look at that. Uh, I I try, man. I try. Like I said, it's just about being honest, yo. I try, I try, I try to be an honest, honest fighter. At the end of the day, man, don't don't we? Well, I can only speak for myself and like any other younger fighters coming up. Don't take this stuff too seriously. You know, this you're never as good as they say. You're never as bad as they say. Things never as good as the, as you think it is, and it's never as bad as you think it is either, man. At the end of the day, what's really gonna happen when all these fans go away is gonna be the people that you surround yourself with. And I got a pretty good solid circle. So I I want to ask you about a couple of guys. You know, people are throwing guys like Bryce Mitchell out there at you. Are you are will you are you willing to fight a guy like Bryce or Calvin Cater? Yo, uh, like guys like that. Is there anyone else? Say you don't get the Korean zombie fight. Once you're in the UFC, you have to be ready to fight everybody. And I, I, I asked for the Bryce fight before um they gave me Giga, you know, but I, for some reason it wasn't working out. And then <laughs> Bryce is funny. I can't tell if Bryce is fucking with me. He's a cool guy, you know. I can't tell if he's fucking with me or if he just didn't know. But when they first told told us about the um, Mosvar fight, I, I asked to step in for the November 5th thing. But let me paint a timeline for you. I had I had um I peaked for the Giga fight, like training camp wise. So they told me I was gonna have the Giga fight. They um moved it two more weeks. So I kept the same like weight um weight cut regiment for an extra two more weeks and then I fought again. Then I kept the weight cut regiment for like three more days because I was trying to replace um Mosvar for the Bryce then. And then when they finally told me what um it wasn't gonna happen, I was like, all right, man, time for me to just get get back to normal, eat like regular. And then like three, four days after that, Bryce goes on Twitter. He was like, all right, Sadiq, I'm ready to accept your challenge, but I'm worried you're too fat. And then I replied back, I was like, yeah, you know, oh, yes, I'm too fat. You know, like that's a, I I don't know if he was expecting me to like like challenge it, but like 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 I've been saying this whole interview, I'm an honest guy. I'm not I'm not I'm not gonna try to play the tough guy, Joe. I was like, yes, I'm too fat, Bryce. <laughs> like, I'm not fighting you in November, you know. But if it does happen one day in the future, I'll be happy. I feel like Bryce is too uh pure for his own good like he basically it doesn't seem like he means any harm he just basically says whatever the hell comes out of you know yeah, his yeah, brain nah, I, I think I, I think he's a genuine dude for sure yeah. I um I ran into him at the at the PI maybe like maybe like no not at the PI it was at a hotel like a few months back and I was like man Bryce how, how come you keep ignoring like my my call outs man like how come you're not gonna fight me and then he was like 
and I'm not scared, motherfucker. Like, you know, like, what is his accent? <laughs> and I was like, man, nah, I don't think it's scared. I think he thought I was trying to, like, punk him. Yeah. But I was like, nah, I don't think it's scared. I just thought you would think it's an easy fight, you know, because I'm I'm just a striker, you know. I thought you would want to jump on it. And he was like, um, no, nah, I don't think you're an easy fight at all. It's like, how come, how come when I was behind you, you, you wasn't calling me out back then? I was like... You know how this works. <laughs> why, why, why I call you out when you're behind me? I was like, I told him, I said, it's the same reason why you're not accepting my fight right now. It's like, I'm behind you now. It's like, it's like, man, like I said, man, be real, man. Whenever you see these fighters, like, posing and faking on these interviews, man, you guys got to hold them accountable, too. Yeah. Let them tell them be real. That will, that will help a lot of the um culture around MMA. There's so many, like, trolls and and stuff on twitter i think some fighters like feed that you know like they feed into that kind of stuff but if, if i feel like for real if all of us are like just straight up and real about stuff we could end up a lot of loser mentality that's around mma especially on twitter man mm. twitter is like a cesspool of like just <laughs> loser like fans you know like they, they 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 paint a bad light on real mma fans because that's what people think mma fans are and to be honest it's like Sometimes I think that's what MMA fans are, you know, just because there's so many of them. There's so many of them. I, um, in that conversation I had with Bryce, um, somebody showed me a screenshot of somebody that was like, why the fuck did this guy block me? <laughs> and like, I was like, to be honest, I don't know why I blocked them because I RSVP people's blocks. <laughs> and like, I tell people, I tell people at my, at, at my gym, they think I'm joking, but I will literally reserve your block. And that's what I, what I mean by that is if I see you trolling another fighter or another celebrity, I just block you just for the hell of it. <laughs> like, I, I realize that I, I, that I exist. So I RSVP your block. So whoever that guy was, I probably, you probably didn't do anything to me, but I RSVP your block <laughs> for, for trolling somebody else before you realize I existed. You know, it's funny that you do that because I, I noticed with MMA fans, the most fair weather fans out of any sport. One minute they love you, one loss, they fucking, you're the worst thing that's ever happened. It's crazy. You should see what people's DMs look like when they lose. Like like when I lost to Arnold, is is so bad. And But like, I, I'll keep it real with them. Like if I see it and I, I'll reply sometimes and a hundred out of a hundred, it never fails. If you reply to any troll on 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 your inbox, it always change. They're gonna say, "Oh, I didn't know you was gonna respond." I'm a big fan, and then it, it's every single time. It never fails. Like mm -hmm. it's so consistent. It's like, man, I would reply to you if you were just a cool guy too. Like you don't have to come into the DMs and troll. You know, like I talk to I talk to like MMA fans all the time. It's like that's not a way to get attention. Mm -hmm. It's like after they always say that, oh. I'm a big fan. Then I block him again. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I just wanted to see if it will work, you know? It's <laughs> consistent every single time, you know? But Good for you. Just, just be cool, y'all. If y'all watching this interview, just be a regular person. I mm. saw somebody um in the comments say they never block anybody. And I used to be like that, too. And this is what I mean by, like, me liking GSP and stuff like that because I like fighters that are honest. And this one actually came from Michael Bisbin. And I remember I used to take pride in not blocking people because it was like some ma macho shit, you know? It was like, man, I don't give a fuck about um, social media. It's not real. I don't um, I, I don't block anybody, blah, 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 on some macho shit. But then Bisbin, and I heard him say it on his TV show, he said, in real life, whenever he sees an asshole or, so or somebody that's just a piece of shit, he doesn't interact with them, so why would he do it online? Mm -hmm. And as soon as he said that, it made all the sense in the world to me. I was like, "Wait, that's a great point. Why? Like, the people don't deserve um to be in in your life if they're just a piece of shit. Just just block them, and and then they disappear. Then they really don't exist. Yeah. Like that's what shows you like that social media is not a real place because you just poop." And that person stops existing forever. We're, we're wired as human beings for some reason to just be drawn to negative. It's weird. Like, even if I'm doing a stream, like, everyone could be saying something nice and one knucklehead would say one something. Person. Yeah, and all of a sudden you're like, fuck that guy. But meanwhile, you're, you're missing all the nice stuff. And I noticed on Twitter, like, for instance, Aljamain Sterling is the perfect example. He only yeah. responds to the trolls. And it's yes. like, dude, what? It, it, life would be so much easier if you just ignored them. He's getting yeah. roasted. Have you seen what's going on on Twitter with Aljo? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I see. I go, I go out of my way to respond to like funny people, mm-hmm. like pe- people that post like memes and like like good jokes. You know, like if it's if it's a troll, it's gonna be rare for you to see me respond to somebody trolling. That's smart. That's a smart move. There you go. A piece of advice from Sadiq Yusuf. Learn, learn from this stream over here. Look at you. Who's better than you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, quick picks over here. Charles Oliveira, Islam Makachev, the main event, UFC 280. Do you have a, a guy you're rooting for? You're picking who's who's going to win? Well, I don't have any, anyone I'm rooting for in that fight, but if I had to pick, if I was forced to pick, I'll pick Islam. Islam for the win. Okay, I'm with you on that. My co-host is Charles, and I notice a lot of fighters are picking Charles, so you're in the minority when it comes to the I, fi- I, um, To be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if Charles won at all, mm-hmm. but I, I I do think Islam's going to win. Do you think he could get a finish in this fight? No. If it's a finish, if it's a finish I'm going to go with Charles. Okay, finish Charles, yeah, decision is fight, on. If the fight finishes, yeah, if it ends with a finish, it'll be, it'll be um, Charles. The only way I could see Islam getting a finish is if um, Charles just gasses out, which I don't see happening. What do you think about how Habib in his corner and, and in the lead-up has been really leaning into going after Charles? He's not going to show up. He's this, he's that. What do you think about it's, that? I, I, don't, I, I honestly don't think it is Habib. I think it might be um, um uh, Ali. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Have you had run run-ins with Ali? Yeah, he's a he's, man. He's a good guy. He's all he's always been good to me. Like mm-hmm. ev- I think I I probably met him like maybe before my debut or something like that. But every single interaction I had with him is good. To be honest. All his fighters have great things to say about him too. You know, I've I've never seen any fighters on his roster that had anything bad to say about him, and the only people that have bad things to say about him are usually like the people his fighters fight. Yeah, and media because he won't let him his fighters fight uh, talk to media for some reason. What do you think yeah, about? I, it? I I don't know. There might be I don't know what the method to that madness is. Yeah. Well, I guess they're all fighting for belts and stuff like. So I guess something he's doing something right with those guys and gals. Yeah. Um, Aljamain Sterling, uh, TJ Dillashaw. We spoke about that. You're leaning with Aljo, or <laughs> no? I'm, I'm I'm putting my hands together <laughs> and wishing the best for Aljo. I don't know who's gonna win. Yeah, but I definitely want Aljo to win. <laughs> there you go. I tell you what, TJ Dillashaw getting plus money on this fight is kind of like oh, he's a underdog. Yeah. Oh wow. I mean, man. I don't like saying any good things about those. <laughs> <laughs> next, next guy. <laughs> you know what's funny? When I I went to UFC 217 where where Dillashaw fought um uh Cody, and everyone was cheering and cheering and cheering for uh Cody Garbrandt. Like everyone hated Dillashaw, and this is really? before. No, back back in those back in those days, I was still I was a Dillashaw guy, so yeah. I would have definitely been cheering for Dillashaw. Dude, I was I, shocked. I, I, stopped, I stopped becoming a Dillashaw guy until until, he, until I found out he was a cheater. That's it. All right. Uh, so and I I got to get your thoughts on this. Jan versus O'Malley. Man, I to be honest, like I'm picking Jan, but I don't think anybody could confidently pick O'Malley because we don't have enough information on O'Malley. Mm-hmm. O'Malley's a good striker. Like he's really, really good. I wouldn't be surprised if he wins that fight. But um, just off like math, if I was like an insurance guy or something, I would have to pick Peter. You know, it's a safer, it's a safer bet because we kind of, we kind of know what we're getting. But with with um O'Malley, our chance to learn about what type of fighter he is was when he fought um Pedro. But that fight was so freaking weird and awkward. Like <laughs> we didn't get, we didn't get any information out of that. You know. Yeah. So I'll have to pick Peter Aaron, but the fact that it's a three round fight, man, that's that that really helps O'Malley a lot. Yeah. Peter starts so slow, you know, like he he gives up the first round against anybody. So <laughs> you can't it's hard to do that in a three round fight. My last question to you, it's twenty twenty two, right? We're we're hitting the home stretch over here. You're sitting at number twelve in the rankings. At the end of twenty twenty three, where do you see yourself? Man, I see myself at number five or, or four, to be honest. Like, if I could get that um, Korean zombie fight, and that will put me definitely number six or better, and then one more after that, that will be based on who wins these next couple of fights that are happening in the next couple of months. There you go. Well, Sadiq, listen, I was a fan before. I'm even a bigger fan now. You're a great guy and a fantastic uh, c- uh, talking with you over here. If you have any last words to the uh, community, the MMA holes, now's the time to get it out. Oh, man, I feel like I already talked your guys' ears off, man. My phone's on like 10%. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, follow me on everything. It's all super Sadiq. Like I said, the only thing I'm. 
I'm I'm more active on like the TikTok stuff, like for like live interactions. But ev- everything else is kind of just post, post and go, post and go, post and go. But yeah, everything's super sadiq. The links in my bio for like my merch and all that kind of stuff for all my social media. And thank you for having me. Any content coming out on YouTube? I just subscribed to your YouTube channel as well. Anything we can man, look forward to? My coach kills me on that, man. I. I <laughs> So I was consistent for a little while when I was doing like these story times, but then I got lazy, you know? It's like, if you want to catch my story times, I'll give them out to you on these kind of interviews. But I'm just being lazy. I need, if I had like maybe like a partner or something, I don't know, man. I, I got I got I got to do something with that YouTube channel. Well, I mean, when you got a million followers on TikTok, I mean, who cares about YouTube, right? <laughs> yeah, yo, the people on TikTok, most of them don't even know who I am. Like, so when I, when I, when, every time I fight, they're like, oh, wait, you're really a UFC fighter. <laughs> <laughs> or, like, or like whenever I go li- live, like talking about like UFC stuff, there's like, oh, this guy's actually like a UFC fighter. I met a girl one time at a at a cookout. And she was um she was talking about she's just talking about social media and stuff like that in general. I'm thinking she knows I'm a fighter. So I she she asked me, she said, How do you deal with notifications? And I was like, Yeah, um, I, I turned off every notification on every social media app or any apps like that before I got the contender series fight. And like now that I'm in the UFC, I've already I'm already used to not seeing any notification. And she and then like I saw her face was like very confused. And I and then she was like what? She was like, um what's UFC? I was like, you know like like fighting. You're like she's like, oh you oh you're a UFC fighter? I was like, yeah. I was like what I, I asked her like what was you talking about? I was like, no, I saw your TikTok page. Like, like so the whole time she was just talking to me in reference of the stuff I post on TikTok, <laughs> and she had no idea I was an MMA fighter in real life. Dude, I was crazy. like, "Well, I guess I'm a TikTok guy now." <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be something else? So, like, your TikTok it blows up to the point where it's like you just vanish from the UFC, and next thing you know, you're the big TikTok star. Yeah, but the problem is because I'm not on there dancing. <laughs> no, my face. Nobody knows who I am. It's just me posting. <laughs> memes on funny stuff like man you're like man your videos are so funny blah 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 it's like oh who, who are you <laughs> <laughs> well i got i got something i got something to pitch what you fight all right let's 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 get this out here korea korean zombie you knock him out you do a jordan levitt and twerk in korea after the win <laughs> <laughs> yo you know what's funny i literally did an interview yesterday they said play out your favorite the question was for me to play out my favorite dance move and i was like i was like well a couple weeks ago i was at the ufc pi i ran into jordan levitt i I was like hey jordan i'm a big fan of you and like i saw in his face he did not believe it at all you know he was like he was like and I was like, nah, I'm, I'm serious. Like, me and my friends, like, we call you Torque Man. Like, I'm a big fan of you. I said, keep doing what you're doing. And, like, his voice is so proper, you know. He's like, he's like, oh, well, well thank you. I, I appreciate that, you know. <laughs> I was like, so, yeah, shout out shout out to Torque Man, you know. I, <laughs> I, 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 like, I like him because he's goofy, you know. Like, like I, like I was saying before, that's an honest guy right there. He's just, he's just out there being himself, man. I, we had him on a couple of times. We twerked together on air. We actually did a whole. Me and Jordan. He was teaching me how to twerk on air. No joke. <laughs> and uh, it takes another level of comfortability and being like secure with yourself to, to be able to do some shit like that. You know? <laughs> he is the man. I was so devastated when Patty won. I was like, no, I wanted him to win so bad. Yeah, I, I was rooting for him. I was rooting for him. I wanted him to beat to beat Patty. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, Sadiq, thank you so much for coming on. I can't wait to talk to you again, man. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me, man. I got I got to leave y'all. My phone is literally about to die. Be good, my man. Sadiq, super Sadiq Yusuf live on the show. Let's go, baby. What do you say in the chat? What do you think? What a guy. What a guy, man. Marathon interview over here. And I loved every minute of it. We talked Game of Thrones. Nice of Sadiq to come on the show. Listen. We're, we're going head-to-head with the MMA Hour, and I looked at his guests over there. I'm like, boring. Come on over here. We're going to talk to Sadiq Youssef. And by the way, Sadiq is in a really good spot at Featherweight, so I'm really glad he came on the show. Coming off a 30-second guillotine win uh, two weeks ago, and the guy has got one blemish uh, with Arnold Allen, who's up there uh, fighting Calvin Cater. Uh, you look at the, uh, the Featherweight division, you got Volkanovski sniffing around at 155. I got to be honest with you. 
you could actually piece together a way for Sadiq. Sadiq says at the end of 2023, he'll be top five. I tell you what, at the end of 2023, if everything falls into place, he could be fighting for a belt. Like, no joke, Sadiq Yusuf could be fighting for a belt. People are sleeping on him. You got your Bryce Mitchells. You know, Giga got, got bumped down a notch. Arnold Allen is a problem. He did beat Sadiq. But Sadiq had the story. He said he didn't want to make any excuses. But he said when he fought Ar- Arnold Allen, he was still having that y- long COVID symptom situation. So who knows? In a rematch, we could see a different fight. It's not like Allen knocked him out, went to a decision over there. Super Sadiq Yusuf. What do you say in the chat? What do you think? You find some great people. Thank you, uh, the Gozarian. I, I tell you what, I was really uh, happy when he said he would be down to come on. Super nice guy, man. No pun intended with the super. And thank you guys for the the chat, the uh, donations. I appreciate that. If you guys donate while we have an interview, I'll pause it, but I'll play him at the end for sure. Uh, he's a good dude. He's damn savage. Real nice guy. I tell you what, you know, uh, there are a lot of times where I'm just like, ah, I don't know if I can do interviews anymore. You know, I hate dragging these guys on. You know, they got busy schedules, this and that. But, like, if they're willing to do it and they're down to just chat, like guys like Sadiq, I could do that all day. Like, I could I could just over and over again have no problems. It's just, it's the people out there that just, like, there are some people just like, I don't want to do this shit. And I don't blame them. You know, why do you want to go on Joe Schmo's podcast over there or a show or whatever? This is a show, not a podcast. Uh, but, like, you know, you got other things to do. So the fact that he came on was very nice of him over here. We have uh, some other stuff to talk about on this show. It's not all about Sadiq Yusuf. It's about UFC 280. That's right, UFC 2. I could have clickbaited like crazy and had that front and center, got a, hundreds of views or whatever, you know, for the, the UFC 280 situation. But I just wanted to have a sit-down conversation with Sadiq. This portion of the show, we're going to roll into the UFC 280 uh, point of things. It is fight week. It is fight week over here for UFC 280, so I'm very much looking forward to it. I'm pumped up. I feel the juice. I mean, everyone is buzzing about this card. They're saying best card of the year. Uh, it really is top to bottom really good. I saw Chukagian's an underdog in her fight. I'm like, shit, that might be a... There are underdogs that like are legit solid bets that you can make. Wednesday, we have uh, my bookies... Um, Odds maker coming on the show. So that's going to be real interesting. The odds maker, the person that actually puts the numbers together on mybookie.ag coming on the show to talk about UFC 280. So that's going on. But today, Monday before, I see someone say Aljamain Sterling. I mean, I, we'll get into Aljo. I, I'm a, I was picking Aljo, picking Aljo, picking. And then I saw on Twitter. <sighs> I mean, one's in the chat if you know where I'm going to go with this, but I feel like he's making a critical error here, arguing with people on Twitter before a massive fight against TJ Dillashaw. I feel like he's, 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 uh, he should not be doing this. Ah, uh, super chat. Uh, super chat coming in. What do we Hanging got? with DA boys in the afternoon. Hey, Sup, Chris. Up, Thank you, Sober Carl, for the $2 donation. I appreciate that. Hey, you guys, donating on an early stream, just showing up on an early stream, I really appreciate that. I want to play a word from our sponsors real quick, and then when we get uh, back into the show, we're going to talk about the real stuff that's going down. By the way, so my intro didn't play. Let me just see if I can fix this over here. That was weird how the, you know, live TV, what are you going to do? Shit happens. Let's see if I can get this to play real quick. Super odd. Let's see. So go like this. Okay. Hmm. You wonder why? Let me try this. Give me one second here. Add. Let's see. Window. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So weird that that happened. Okay. There we go. Yeah. I don't know what happened. It would just do like something like this. I don't all right, so we're going to play a quick <laughs> we're going to play a quick break over here and when we come back from the break, we will talk about UFC 28. That's what everyone wants to talk about, so we'll be right back.
Cause I'm a CBDX.com boy. We sell legal Delta ATAC. We. It will get you very strong. We sell gummies, eh? Buzz base oil in a set. And they post on Twitter. Oh, yeah. Hey, on CBDX.com. You better get with them. You're gonna get real high. You're gonna get that tree. You're gonna get real down loud from the Ooh, island boys. You're gonna get it all down. And so from the ground, you be smoking bud. You be smoking trees. We a different breed. You smoking green and purple. And then you create a hurt. Yeah, it's hurt. You better get with CBD. CBDX.com, yeah. cause we some CBDX.com boy. You better tap in on the website, right, Island boy. right now. When it comes to underwear, there's nothing more important than comfort. Why empty your pockets for generic underwear that loses comfort, quality, and style when you can slip into a pair of sheath and get even more out of your daily wear? With sheath underwear, you can treat your jewels like royalty as they are given their own private sanctum, keeping them secure and you in a state of bliss. Get 20% off sheath now using promo code MMAHOLES. That's M-M-A-H-O-L-E-S with the link in the description below. And for the ladies? Absolutely! Sheath isn't just for men. Ladies can now experience Sheath's style, comfort, and functionality too. Sheath for Women is crafted using a signature modal elastine fabric blend for form-fitting breathability that will not affect the natural pH environment or the microclimate of the skin while producing that long-lasting, unimpeded comfort. Use promo code MMAHOLES, M-M-A-H-O-L-E-S, for 20% off at sheathunderwear.com. Let's go, baby. You ready? Thank you to our sponsors so much. Appreciate you guys supporting us. Thank you to everyone that donated. And if you just jumping in, we had Sadiq Yusuf live on the show. I saw some people throwing some other featherweight names out there in the chat. I do want to pick your brain before we roll into the UFC 280 uh, portion of the stream over here. As um, I want to, I'm going to throw a name out. You tell me who wins. Okay. He's got very tough people ahead of him. And I want to know what you think. I see Taporia over there. Not ahead of him, but Taporia is a tough son of a bitch, man. Real tough guy over there. Uh, but let's see. Let's 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 go ahead of him instead. If he were to fight Giga Chikadze, would you go with Super or would you go with Giga? Let me know in the chat. Real quick. Super or Giga in the chat. Giga Chikadze was a guy who was supposed to fight. That fell through. And now it looks like he's he's looking elsewhere. Super or Giga? I think Giga got exposed. I thought I thought Giga was unbeatable, but he is beatable. Okay, Sonosi says Super. Ronnie says Super. Sober Carl says um Super. I think Super takes it. Wow, look at that. Looks like a sweep of the Supers in the chat. Okay, let me ask a, another one over here. Let's do it. Uh, let's let's go with the Korean Zombie, a guy I'm a big fan of. Korean Zombie versus Super. Sadiq, zombie or super? Zombie or super? Let me know, let me know. And I think the way zombies looked recently, I think this is the perfect time for a guy like Sadiq to get in there. But let's see. Super easy. Uh, super. Wow, look at that. Could go ne uh, neither way. Or either way, trying to say? 
If it goes neither way, then draw. Super Decision, perfect matchup, says B-Man. I tell you what, man. Super Sadiq gets a win in Korea against the Korean zombie. And then twerks. <laughs> That'd be something else. Uh, all right, so it was either. Super, okay. I'm going to ask. Now we're going to just jump up to two people. I hope you're ready for this. I mean, we're taking a massive leap. Max Holloway. Super Sadiq, who gets the win? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Let's see how biased we are over here. Uh, Super Sadiq or Max Holloway? I'm biased for Korean Zombie, though. I love Korean Zombie. He's like one of my favorite featherweights. Even though he's on the downcline, still a fan. Bryce Mitchell is the future champ. Yeah, Bryce versus Sadiq is a good one. I say Zombie, but that's only because I know uh, Zombie a little better. Okay, Max, Max. I have a feeling a lot of people could be picking uh, Blessed. You know, I mean, former champion, still got it. Uh, Volkanovski is like the thorn in his side. But Max Holloway or Sadiq, Super Sadiq Yusuf. You know, I was watching some of Yusuf's uh, previous fights, and this guy, man, even if he's held against the fence, even if he's taken down, like, he always gets out of it. He's got, like, he's got that Nigerian strength, that power that the, that they're just, that's in their blood. And um, Sadiq's getting better and better. But, you know, you're looking at guys like Ortega, Holloway, uh, Volkanovski, Yair Rodriguez. I mean, Jesus, you got, like, guys up there that are problems. Max might be a problem. Dang, Max is solid, but super is quick, says Ronnie John. Need to see super versus uh, people, more people first. Oh, yeah, we're just throwing it out there. Hypothetically, you know, if the if those fights were ever to happen. Sadiq, you do. You need more information on Sadiq for sure. But he's interesting. He's he, I would say he's the dark horse. You know, not many people out there really realize that he's ranked. Like he's number 12. Not featherweight. So that's that's a big deal. All right. Enough with Sadiq. We spent too much time on him, for God's sakes. Go give him a follow on his social media. Great guy. Uh, oh, it's Sucker Punch. All right, so this is this is a different ad for Super Sadiq on Twitter. It's Sucker Punch ENT. Sucker Punch ENT on Twitter. And then on Instagram, he's Super Sadiq. So S-U-P-E-R-S-O-D-I-Q. Go say the MMA hole said hello. And like he said, if you don't troll him, he'll, he'll talk to you. He'll chat with you over there. All right. So, Aljamain Sterling. Oh, Aljo. I went from picking uh, TJ Dillashaw and I just rolled over to Aljo. I love I love Aljo's confidence. I really do. I think Aljamain Sterling's confidence uh, through the roof going into this fight. I think his grappling is going to be a problem. Where is his... Um, where's his Twitter? Imagine he deleted his Twitter. That'd be hilarious. I w if I was his his people, I would probably tell him to do that. Uh, Al Joe Sterling. Oh, let's see. There we go. Funk Master. Wait, that's not him. <laughs> uh, was it Funk Master? Oh, here we go. There it is. Okay. So he has been going back and forth over here. He's close to shields. Let's go to his tweets and replies. So he took a picture with Andrew Tate. And um, it, very controversial. Wait, did he did he remove his? Let's see, tweets and replies. Okay, no, it's still here. Yeah. So, oh boy, yeah, you can go down this rabbit hole. So, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's still here. So he's been going back and forth with Twitter for a couple of days now because there was a picture that popped up of him. And, uh, well, here's Sean O'Malley with Andrew Tate. But apparently Andrew Tate's a very controversial figure, I guess. I don't know. I don't know much about Andrew Tate. I know he's a former kickboxer. He's he, he's worth a lot. Uh, but um, he has some hot takes on things. And Aljamain Sterling, basically, like, I don't know the exact phrase, but he basically was saying, um, you know, girls should be more careful going out to clubs and stuff like that and walking in shady areas. You know, not like girls should get raped. Like, people twisted this shit. I, I gotta get the ex exact quote. Let me see. There is one media member out there who is a perennial victim. I'm not gonna show her... Well, maybe I will. Like... 
There's a media member on Twitter that's a female that it's a shame. It's a shame that she's got to bring in like this side of things. It's 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 nauseating. I feel like she should leave it be. Apparently, she's a victim of of rape. Right? She she's she's been in that situation, which is a horrible horrible thing. You don't want to hear anyone talk about you know stuff like that and and be a victim of it. But she kind of took what Aljo said and kind of spun it out of context. And now this is this whole uproar against Sterling. And Sterling got sucked into it. Man, she responds to so much shit. All right, here we go. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get to the actual Aljo. Com- I mean, this goes on and on. What Aljo said is true. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a hard truth. He's Aljo's not wrong, and I understand what he was saying, but it, people are always spinning shit. Like, it's... It really is annoying. All right, let's see. Where's the original? I mean, this is going on and on and on. Look at this. So, all right, she circles this. All right, here, here's what Aljo said. 100% correct. Uh, also said was all the mental health issues and predators out there. Why walk home by yourself at odd hours of the night in sketchy places? I think it says places there. I can't. She. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, places. Uh, that was the responsibility. Uh, he mentioned for making safe decisions, which makes sense, although uh, doesn't justify rape. Okay. What did he say that was so fucking wrong there? Now, listen, uh, for me, Aljo's the cringiest is Ronnie John. I hear you. I find Aljo. I know Aljo. We've met him a bunch of times. He doesn't do our show anymore I, for reasons that he never really told us. But anyway, um, I, from the interaction I have with him, very nice guy. And and we're friends with teammates and and, and uh, his coach, you know, and Ray Longo. Very nice people. Everyone over there at Law is nice. And Aljo has never been nasty to us, you know. Um, but yes, on, on Twitter, he's been cringy in certain ways where I understand why people have kind of turned on him. But I don't know, uh, although it doesn't justify rape, doesn't even need to be stated. I 100% agree. As much as you do not like Aljamain Sterling, I think we could all agree that Aljo didn't say anything wrong here. He's not ju- He's not glorifying rape. You know, it's like... Like, I'll just give you this comment over here. Aljamain, please think about what women in this uh, thread are saying and take it as a learning experience. Your words matter because you have a platform. The comment from men in this thread is truly disgusting. Now, maybe the responses are disgusting. She could be right about that. I didn't read any of that shit. Um, Like, you could just see a little bit. Like, Aljo's defending himself, and then he says, You said that rape victims hold some responsibility for being raped. If they are not, if they are out at night, rape victims do not hold any responsibility for rape. None under any circumstances. Uh, imagine your wife, daughter, mother in that situation. You wouldn't, you would be livid if someone blamed them. Amy, dude, like what the fuck? And Aljo's, you know, she's a media member. She's got credentials, you know, like, like, and she's going back and forth with a guy that's got a fight this weekend. He he didn't even say anything. Like, but the problem, Aljo is burying himself by constantly having to defend himself. And if you're constantly defending yourself over and over and over again, what these victims are doing is they're, they're pulling, every time you give them more information to work with, they're just going to pull certain things from each thing that you say and spin it against you. And he got sucked into this vortex. And here we are, fight week, UFC 280. He's the co-main event against TJ Dillashaw, a guy that could be taking steroids again. Who knows? Judging from the pictures over here, I'll show you. Let's see if he popped him up. Like there was there was a picture that he put up of TJ. Maybe it's on his Instagram. But I gotta be honest with you, with all this craziness going on, I just swung back to TJ. And TJ getting plus money, I swung back to TJ. And it drives me fucking nuts. It drives me nuts because wait, where is that post? Oh, he doesn't have it anymore. If someone could find the post of Aljo, like he he has a close up of TJ's abs. And there's like old bumps all over it. So Aljo's insinuating he could be on the uh, the juice again. You know. Okay, troll away. But I think he's getting too wrapped up. He's in Abu Dhabi. He's trying to, you know, I guess, kill some time over there. I can't find the post. But yeah, I, I swung back in TJ's favor in, in my predictions. 
Because I, th I don't think TJ's wrapped up in any of this shit. I think TJ's laser focused. He's not on social media arguing with people that are victims in certain ways and, and want to pull some sort of attention from fighters. Aldo trying to be uh, Sugar Sean or something, I guess. Yeah, so I mean, he's putting himself out there. Like he wants to be a, a presence on social media. I feel like this could severely backfire. Now, if Aljo goes in there and finishes TJ, everything's wiped away. Aljo did everything right. But if he loses, you, you have to point fingers at all these other things that happened during the week. TJ's natural. Uh, they retested his old sam samples. I don't know how true that is. Aljo trying to be Sugar Sean or something. Oh, we saw that. He has a fight coming up. Focus on the fight. Doesn't know what the fuck he is. On social media, I still think he is finding himself. Hey, Mills, I got to go deal with uh, Carl. I'll be back. All right, Lou Dog. Thank you. Thank you for saying a wonderful, wonderful interview. Appreciate wonderful, that. Wonderful. I had a good time talking to him. Yeah, sometimes I get lost in the interview and I'm just kind of just bullshitting with the guy. And I thought it was I thought it was very interesting. Told her choke on my uh, proper 12 you victim. <laughs> yeah, I, and 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 it, and if you're a media member too, I don't know if you should really severely be this certain media member. She keeps on going online and making comments about her weight and then like retweeting people trolling her and then like putting a spotlight on that and then being the victim. You know, like all these things, like she's just like starving for attention in all the worst ways. I understand. Listen, a lot of us are that are putting content out there, we want attention. At the end of the day, it's the truth. I'm doing a YouTube channel. I like the attention. I like to fucking talk to people from all over the world. It's just not like now that I have a kid, it's not my number one thing anymore. Like I don't, I don't, I don't starve for it so much that I have to fucking be a victim or I have to do things in a certain way so I can keep on craving that 24 seven attention. I turn it off and I be a family man. This woman here, she doesn't do that. Like she doesn't turn it off. She's always plugged in and she's constantly going out there and just and just being the victim over and over again. And she probably had some traumatic things happen to her. She needs to see a fucking therapist, not scrutinize Aljamain Sterling on on a fight week and pull information from what Aljamain's saying and twisting it. It's 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 like the lowest thing you could possibly do on social media. It's a scumbag move. And I'm not, I'm not saying what happened to her was, was great, and, and, and I'm not saying, oh, good for her. You know, she got raped, blah, blah. I'm saying that's horrible. If you have these mental issues, that PTSD from that, do not go and put it on other fucking athletes or put words in other people's mouths. You got to fucking stop. You got to stop it. You got to fucking pump the brakes. You got to fucking put out the fire and go in your personal life and deal with those demons. Don't drag it into your work life. It's just disgusting disgusting like it's sad it's sad to see that people have to be a victim she did this whole thing she put a youtube video out there and instead of talking about the interview she's talking about maybe one person cracking a joke about her weight and ignoring everyone in that comment section saying something nice it's mental illness some women with very uh severe victim complexes will literally take any attention they can uh, get from their past. They want uh, to feel bad 24-7 from. Yeah, what she is doing to Aljamain Sterling, say what you will about Aljo, whether you like him or you dislike him. She is taking him and she's twisting his words. It's wrong. It's fucking wrong. Uh, if you want to see, I, I showed it on air. If you want to see more from that media, I'm not going to fucking hang her. To, she's hanging herself. Go to Twitter. Go to Aljamain, his tweets and replies. Super. You'll find her in two seconds. You'll find her in two seconds. And if you scroll through her stuff, you'll 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 sort out all the crazy. It's 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 happened on numerous occasions. And and there was one time I got sucked in and I was like, fuck, man, like what stop with the victim shit. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna engage on Twitter with that stuff. She can hang herself. It's it's sad. It's sad because she probably went through some real shit. And I, I'm now picking TJ. Nothing against Aljo. He, he shouldn't be engaging in this stuff. Hopefully, as the week progresses, he completely unplugs from that and can be laser-focused. Maybe he's using it as a distraction so he doesn't constantly be in his head about the fight. Maybe it works. I move to TJ. Now, when I watch the face-offs and see all that thing unwind, maybe I'll change back again to Aljo. Right now, I am picking TJ Dillashaw at, with plus money. I mean, that helps, too, Aww, to get the win. super chat. Uh, the champ has a name and he will win round one sub. The champ has a name and he will win round one sub. Okay. 
So, and that's from Dire Goth 3 Gaming. Thank you for the donation. Appreciate that. Who are you talking about? Talking about Charlie Olives, who's not technically the champ, but he, I mean, in our eyes, he is. Are we talking about Aljamain Sterling, who we're just talking about right now? Let me know who that champ is. Uh, add me on Goat Milk, uh, waiting for, I will, uh, after the stream, I'll jump over there and, and uh, or if Jesse's watching, she'll, we'll get you in before the fights for sure. Uh, let's see, let's see. Who's winning this weekend? Preston. Okay, so I am still laser focused and locked on Islam Makachev in the main event. And I like the fact that a lot of fighters out there, uh, the actual UFC fighters are saying um, Oliveira is going to win. Uh, Sadiq came on, he picked Islam. Um, but, you know, everyone I think is on the same page where, you know, the, the, the logical people know that this could go either way. Now, in my mind... I have this mystical thought of Islam Makachev putting a hurting on Charles. Now, I understand people are like, with what information can you actually say that's going to happen? Physical informa information with his, his uh, past opponents? No, it's a gut feeling. Like, I've seen his skills. Maybe it hasn't been against the guys that Charles has faced. But I see his skills, skills and I see a parallel to Habib. And with that blemish, that freak loss... Him getting knocked out earlier in his career, I feel like that's only going to help him. The only negative thing I have to say about Islam Makachev is the pressure. I brought this up many times before, and I'm still with that. This opportunity is tailor-made for Islam to win the fight. Abu Dhabi, Habib in the corner, but there's so much weight on those shoulders to beat a very dangerous Charles Oliveira. If Islam loses his fight, it's because of his head. It's because he couldn't handle the pressure. And of course, Charles Oliveira is a fucking savage. I mean, let's be serious. Charles is a beast. You know, if Charles wins this fight, you put him in play as one of the best 155ers of all time. You can actually make that argument. I know technically he's not defending, but in my mind he is. If Charles Oliveira wins this fight against Islam Makachev, lock it up, baby. Charles Oliveira is right there with Habib. You have to, you have to put him in that picture. You have to. Habib left prematurely to, to open up that conversation. But with my mystical thinking here, I think Islam's going to get it done. The conversation's never going to happen. Let me know in the chat. Moving over to the main event, Islam Makachev versus oh, Charles Oliveira. Uh, we got a chef. donation coming in. Dire Goth. Charles Oliveira said he will get it in round one. Okay. I love Oliveira's confidence, and he's saying round one finish. Love it. Charles has less weight. He's technically not the champion. He's going in in hostile territory. Well, not, I mean, I, th I think some of the fans are going to be, some fans will be for Charles. Majority will be for Islam. But I think Charles got nothing to lose. Even if he loses this fight, he did it. He won the belt. You know what I'm saying? Like, he did that crazy comeback story. Like, it all, it all happened. This is just to solidify legacy as, in GOAT status. That's what this is for. If he loses, he loses. He's been there before. Less pressure. Love the confidence. Still leaning towards Islam. I'm greedy. I want something to happen so Volkanovski gets a shot. Okay, so Sean, here's something interesting. And I and I get why you're like that. Because if, if Volkanovski slips in, gets the title, I mean, that catapults Volkanovski. He's already the pound-for-pound pound guy. Here's the problem. And I've heard people say this before. I 100% agree. When you take that risk, the reward is so massive if you win. It's, it's such a mega, mega perfect situation to be in, to become a double champ if you're already sitting at the pound-for-pound pound goat status, you know? But if you lose, it severely knocks you back. Israel Adesanya. Him not taking that fight against Jan Blachowicz, and if he still stayed at middleweight, the things that people would be saying about Izzy, I mean... We're talking unicorn. We're talking like, like some mythical creature that Izzy would be. But he lost. He lost taking a gamble and moving up. Now, at middleweight, I still think he, he's, he's there. He's the guy. But now you're looking at Perea coming in. You're looking at these hungry guys like Chemayev and, and you know, just uh, these guys coming up, uh, the Bo Nichols. People are starting to look past Izzy because he moved up. If he didn't, if he didn't move up, you know, people wouldn't be thinking that. Now, I, I give a lot of credit to Izzy for taking a chance. You know, 
Uh, Habib never did that. Why do you think Habib never did that? Because of guys like Izzy. And if Volkanovski goes up short notice, you know, you can make the, uh, you know, hey, you know, Volkanovski is a fill-in. You know, he didn't really train specifically for one guy or whatever. You can make a million. It doesn't matter. When you look at topology, you see the red mark. You see the L. So the reward is great. The risk is bigger. I think, at least. I think so. I base most of my picks UFC uh, off of uh, what Moss picks. Uh, whoever Moss picks, I'll pick. Let's go. Pick the opposite. I had two fights wrong. So pick the opposite. Lose your money. <laughs> Last week, two fights wrong, baby. That's it. 11, 11 fights, two wrong. Pick against me. I still love you. He's maybe auto the GOAT, especially if he beat. I'm telling you, Islam's going to win. I'm telling you. It's mystical tingling that Islam's going to win this fight. And, I, and I'm kind of bummed that he's the favorite in this one. I'm kind of bummed. True, but the backup fighter is uh, looked at different. No one's going to remember that. Like, as MMA fans, we will remember that. But anything that people are going to see is the blemish. And then look at Israel Adesanya. He went from mythical creature to, ah, beatable. You still see the L. And L's an L, unfortunately. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it is. Now, if you... At this stage, now if you're doing it on the way up, you take a bump, you move back, you know, that's one thing. But if you're taking a gamble as a champion and you lose, there's a problem. If Conor McGregor at 145, he wins that belt 13 seconds, Josie Aldo, he goes up and loses to Eddie Alvarez, say goodbye. The double champ does whatever the double champ wants, say goodbye. Like that, now you take a massive step back, but he won. And look what happened. The reward is there. Volkanovsky, I hope, does not fight for that, that step in. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. Defend. Stay at 145. Keep on running through those guys. There is no rush. There's no rush to go up right now. You're fighting Islam Makachev or Charles Oliveira. You lose to those guys. You take a step back. I don't want to see it. He could be the pound-for-pound pound king and sit there like Mighty Mouse. Look what that fuck... If Mighty Mouse marketed himself better, there would be no argument. He'd be the GOAT. It's that simple. Mighty Mouse is like, ah, who cares? If Mighty Mouse marketed himself better, he would have been the GOAT. Uh, gloss is the fact Izzy would be a doubted light heavyweight loss or not. That's not true. That's not true because here's the thing. We would doubt because we hated, we would, but the doubt would be from no fact doesn't matter speculation there's a big difference between a fact and speculation massive difference uh too damn massa uh, that's fantastic uh, i'll take that shit all day long market mouse yeah I, I wish mighty mouse did it differently but he you know what he left on his own terms so good for him he never really sold out you know i, I kind of wish we just you know got a little bit more on the mic and like that he gave a fuck like, he didn't. When he was doing press, he's like, yeah, whatever. When he was, like, lead-ups to fights, he was just like, oh, okay. I don't want to be here, but I'll, I'm just here. You know, like, that's what it felt like with Mighty Mouse lead-ups. So, that kind of sucked. I, I wish, I'm not saying be a different person. Just show that you, like, kind of care. He didn't. So, I think that's why Mighty Mouse is pushed at the back of the line when people talk about him as in GOAT status. He's right there. But this is not a conversation about GOAT. Someone brought up the Volkanovsky situation. Leave it be. It's nice to have him as a backup, but you have options. You had the Gamrot and Dariush over there. Like, you literally could have mixed and matched and made something happen. It would be interesting. But Volkanovsky coming in, needing Volkanovsky coming in. And I understand if you're from Australia and you want to, you know, you want to, you know, be have your champ as a double champ. Okay, that's cool. If you're a fan of the guy, I get it. But if you're a real fan of the guy, just let him do his thing. Let him sit and just chill and just fucking knock people out because no one's going to be able to doubt that guy. Everyone's just going to be like, okay, I can't argue. The guys, he can't, no one can beat him. But if you go up and you take a chance, it's a problem, man. It's a problem. Ah, oh, super chat. If you lose. Uh, Dyer. What will her reaction be if Izzy wins by co? I'll lose my shit. I will lose. No matter what the outcome is. I, no, I, I'm lying. And thank you, Dyer. Three in a row. Come on, baby. Three. He got the hat trick. 
hat trick of donations over there. Dropping three in a row. What? Thank you guys for the donations. Appreciate it. Listen, it's an earlier stream. I know if you look at our demographic, we're night owls over here. I'm looking to pull some new people in, too. You know, we got to build this community. We can't just fucking stay stagnant, treading water. we got to fucking grow. So I'm here just fishing for some new people, keeping the OGs with us, because we got the OGs are the backbone of the MMA holes. But let's bring some new talent in here. Let's bring some new fucking chatters in here. So thank you guys for sticking it out on an early stream. Really appreciate it. And thank you to the donators. So if Izzy knocks out, we lose our, I mean, Jesse would lose her mind. I would lose my mind. The whole internet would explode for sure. If Izzy gets knocked out, same thing. We will all lose our minds over here if that happens. If it's a boring strategic decision, well, no minds being lost. You got to take those chances to be great. You do. This is the worst time. It's the worst time for Volkanovski to do it. This would, this would be a massive just blemish. Sit there. Win, win, win. And then, like, when you're, like, you're thinking about it. Like, Kamaru Usman, for instance. Before that Leon Edwards fight, like, if he went up, like, he wasn't going to fight Izzy. He wasn't going to fight Izzy. He wasn't going to fight Izzy, right? That's his friend. And he's talking about going up two weight classes. Kamaru, where he stood, like, how old's Volkanovski? Let's see. How old is Alex? Let's see where, where he sits. I'll tell you when he should move up. He's in his 30s, right? The great? He's 34. Okay, you're getting close. You're getting close. You're, you're, you are getting close. I want to see Volkanovsky move up with a full camp. Like ready, specifically training for a sp certain individual. I don't want to see him coming in on standby. I don't. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Thank you for the nice words. Appreciate that. Like, guys, if you're an Alex Volkanovsky, you don't want him taking the chances of standby. I know it's dangerous for, for the person taking the fight, too. I get that. But you're just lowering your odds of your guy winning. You know? Give him a fucking full camp waiting for to, to fight a specific fighter. You know, give him the opportunity. A true fighter's chance in it. Why, why do you want him coming in training for two guys? You know? That's that's my my take on it. Like I get it. People love the glitz, the glamour, you know, the chances, you know, and it, and if it pay rolling of the dice. I'm 45. And rolling of the dice right now as a dad, as the greatest host in the world on YouTube, seasoned veteran of the game over here 6 years in. Rolling of the dice seems fun, but if the risk is higher than the reward, not worth it. It's not. I mean, we're rolling the dice on the show earlier in the day. That is a roll, but I feel like the reward is greater than the risk. That's what I feel. In Volkanovsky's situation over here, filling in short notice, taking a loss in Abu Dhabi against either Islam. Think about this. Charles Oliveira misses weight. He fights Islam. Islam beats the fuck out of him. And then you look at Islam's backstory and you look at his resume, the who did he fight situation. And Volkanovsky loses to this guy. How do you think that's going to make Volkanovsky look? Think about it. And I got to be honest with you. Islam beats Volkanovsky. Sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Islam beats him. But say, you know, it does happen. And Islam loses. Islam wins that fight. How does that make Volkanovsky look? The risk is greater than the reward. You know what I'm saying? Credit to Volkanovski for having the nuts to go up. All the credit in the world. And I'm not trying to, to shit on Volkanovski for even being there. I think he's got balls of steel. Love it. Love it as a fan of this sport. But if I want Volkanovski like notched in stone, like if I want his legacy notched, a guy that's never lost in the UFC, could you imagine he takes the blemish moving up? Standby? Against a guy with a shitty record? People start doubting. Maybe Volk starts doubting himself. Not good. Now at 34 years of age, he's right there. But you can set something like this up. But I, I hope that he defends maybe one or two more fights. And then make a solid bleed up. Going up to be a double champ. Let's go. Or maybe find a guy that's 
more reasonable to beat in that situation. Darius uh, deserves a shot. I agree. Daddy Big Dick. I agree. I think Darius and Gamrod over there. Oh, well, Darius more. But I think I think they had the backup plan ready to go. But Volkanovski makes things interesting. It does. You know? So, Volkanovski getting the eyeballs over here. But in the chat, we're a Monday before. Sadiq Yusuf came on the show. We're talking a little Alex Volkanovski. UFC 280. Main event over here. Where do you stand? What do you think? How's it going to go down? As I am picking Islam Makachev, my co-host Jesse picking Charles Oliveira. We are split down the middle. It bothers me that Charles... Let me see where the lines are now. It, it bothers me that he's an underdog because I, I I know why people would pick that. It's not a bit... I mean, the fact that Charles... I, I don't understand why Charles is not the favorite. So many people are picking him. I, I don't understand. I guess people have mystical thoughts like myself about Makachev. It is mind-boggling that Charles is not the favorite. But I guess Abu Dhabi... You know, home field advantage for Islam, I guess. I don't fucking know. Let's log into this puppy. Uh, I don't want him to look better than McGregor. It's a completely different thing, man. It's a whole different thing. McGregor and Volkanovski, it's it's apples and oranges. What Volkanovski is doing, he's solidifying his, his legacy as pound-for-pound pound goat. Conor McGregor's not the pound-for-pound pound goat. Conor, Conor came in and fucking changed the whole dynamic of the UFC. It became the first ever real double champ. So with his losses and everything like that, it's a whole different trajectory. So Volkanovski and Conor McGregor are two different entities. You know, think about it. Completely different. Uh, let's see, let's see. Makachev. So Oliver is a plus one four one. I get why people are betting it. I get it. If you're a Charlie Olives fan. Oh. I mean, Super chat. it shouldn't be allowed. Last don't know for now, but you introduced me to UFC slash MMA. My first time watching was when you did Moss versus Usman 2. Hmm. Love, peace, and positive energy to her family. Hey, thank you. Well, that's, that's, that's fucking awesome. So Masvidal versus Usman 2 is the first time you jumped in. So you're a relatively new MMA fan, UFC fan. That's awesome. Thank you. Hey, and thank you for the donation. I really appreciate that. And I love the fact that you are new to it. Because in our community, we have people that watch UFC 1. And we got people casually just jumping aboard. Maybe this weekend is their first big UFC event. Very possible. That's what I love. That's what I love about this community. Because, yeah, we joke around about the, <coughs> casual. the casual perspective over here. But at the end of the day... It's all about being a fan. Whether you're new, you're old, whether you want to watch with your, your wife or your girlfriend that's not into it, you want to get her into the sport. We got a community over here of all different shapes and sizes, all different colors and races, people from all over the world, whether you watched it for a long time or just a week. Let me know how long you've been watching the sport. I'm curious. Thank you for the donation. Uh, Join $2.99 a month and become a member. Thank you, Sober Carl. Let's go. Let's pay back those memberships. Member up, baby. Appreciate the members. Yo, the members are fucking awesome. Absolutely awesome. The donators, the members, really love you guys. You have no idea how much we love you guys keeping us on YouTube. Connor Double Champ was my first UFC fight. Says smoke him if you got him. Is that true? Eddie Alvarez, what, 205? Wow. If that was the first UFC fight that you watched, shit, man. It's a good card to get in. Since the tough era, uh, so 2005, long time. Best MMA community in the world. Since Habib versus Connor. So Habib Connor got you into it. I tell you what, Habib Connor, that craziness, I think that that just that sent the, the sport into a whole nother level. I mean, the buzz in Brooklyn with the whole, like we were doing like a, outside the arena, covering the, uh, the, uh, the ally Quinta filling in for Habib, the whole bus happening. Like it was the, the buzz was nuts. I miss it. Like I don't miss the fucking terrorism. I don't miss Connor flying across the maybe I do. Maybe I do need some crazy stories. But I do miss like I miss that buzz. I miss the Habibs, the Connors, those crazy rivalries. I need that again. Like Charles versus Makachev. Uh Habib's doing whatever he can to see. Habib's doing a good job selling it. Like Habib is getting all the headlines. No one else is really selling it. It's just basically pure MMA fans that are into it. 
I think I got into the fights because of uh, the pressers. The worst part about being a UFC fan is having that little twerp Hasbulla shoved down our throat. Yeah, I don't get, I don't get that. It's just, you know, the Nelk Boy thing was a novelty they throw at us. Now Hasbulla, like, I guess if you're popular on social, the UFC would be stupid to, to deny it and dismiss it. I hope Oliveira pulls uh, that W in spectacular fashion. It, very possible, it could happen. Connor talking shit with something to see. It's crazy, man. A lot of those live chats, you know, you can be talking fight week to the biggest event of the year, and somehow Connor's name gets thrown into the mix, no matter what. Like, it's just inevitable. I, that's why I'm hoping guys like O'Malley start winning, uh, Bo Nickel start winning, you know, Islam Makachev starts winning. I know, I know people like Charlie Olives. I got to be honest with you. Islam wins. I mean, it's a whole nother animal. If Islam Makachev becomes the champion, like we have Habib's protege, there's just so many fun options. I think Islam will lean into the trash talking a little bit more because I've seen on his interviews, he has no fear of going up in weight. He has no fear of any opponent. Um, I think it'd be fun. I do. Like, what do you think in the chat? What is better for the UFC? Put aside your bias on who you want to win the fight. What the Chel Sonnen era was what actually got me into it. Um... Israel, Islam, Makachev, or Charles Oliveira, what's more fun as a champion? What, what do you think is better for this sport? Let me know. And I understand why people like Oliveira because he's got the great story. You know, he really does, and he's a very likable guy. I got to be honest, I think Charles Oliveira might be more likable than Islam. Islam, we don't know much about. He's a little dry, but Charles Oliveira is just a sweet, sweet dude. But Islam speaks English. So Islam's got that in his favor. Owls for sure. Okay. Ken, Ken Shamrock with uh, Tito Era. Uh, Charles Oliveira needs to speak English. He he needs he needs to speak English. Because I got to be honest with you, just by speaking English alone helps out tremendously. So hopefully he learns the language a little bit better. Oliveira is more, more fun as a champion too, but uh, he doesn't speak English though. Olives, Islam said that. What did Islam say? You don't understand Makachev will be champ. He is Habib's creation. No, I do. I picked I picked Makachev. And I think he will be champion. Yeah, I, I mean, I it just it just seems clear that he's gonna win in my eyes, in my head. Having a Russian champ, uh, not sure it will be sure uh, super good for the UFC with all that's going on since damn savage. I that's not gonna mean anything, in my opinion. But who knows? I mean, if, <laughs> if the Russia if all that shit ex escalates. And they're drafting people and stuff. Yeah, maybe it could be a problem. I think Oliveira is down to uh, do English course, so I hope he does. I think he's he's starting to speak a little bit of English. So hopefully, yeah. If Oliveira spoke English, it's a whole different animal. He told DC watch the interview. What did he tell DC? He told what about English? I don't think Olives is down to do English uh, English course though. Islam may be the hold on the protege, but he he's not Habib. Islam has a loss already and hasn't been in their deep waters. I mean, Bobby Green is good, but not what Olives has done. A uh, Ratlip is uh, better for the UFC. So I I severely disagree. In fact, I think Islam could be better than Habib. I'm telling you. You not only have the luxury of of having Habib's father when he was alive mentor him. Habib mentoring him who is some say the GOAT right? Definitely the GOAT of 155 so you have those mentors right there. You have the grappling is there. It's solid. You see him gra like like rolling around with fucking Olympians and ragdolling them. I mean that's that's pretty impressive. Put aside his UFC talent. Watch what this guy is doing behind you know behind the scenes the dude's a problem. His striking is like levels higher than Habib's levels Habib's jab just started getting going after, you know, after a couple of title defenses, you know, Habib's claim to fame was his iron face that could take a beating and never bleed. That's, that's what Habib had, but it technically Islam is better. I mean, all around as an all around fighter, Islam tech technically is a better fighter. And this was, this was the, the consensus as he was coming up the rankings. Yes. The talent 
you know, it's to be determined. Like, we still have to figure out, can he beat those top-tier guys? But technically, looking at the man, the guy's a problem. And if he keeps on winning, and if he defends that belt, and he goes up in weight and starts doing shit and mauling people over there, guys, Habib will be old, new, old news. He will be old, and And Habib is willing. He's fine with that. Habib's completely fine with that. Islam has the things that Habib didn't have. The all-around talent and the person in his corner. The two people in his corner. Habib had his pop, but now Islam has a Habib. If if we're gonna find out mentally, is Islam ready for this fight? This is a big test mentally for Islam. Uh it was and, and taking a loss, guys. I understand taking a loss, you know, undefeated, undefeated is a big thing. I get that. But sometimes a fighter needs to take a loss. Sometimes they need it. Because holding that weight on your shoulders of never losing, undefeated, undefeated, that's got to be just an added frustration that's not quite necessary. One loss. I hear your opinion. I can not I can understand uh, what you're saying. He's a professional level, level no doubt. I'll have, uh, hold on, to go back and watch some of Islam's fights. I never thought he could match uh, Habib. I'm telling you right now. Even Habib was saying, like, in his earlier days, that the guy's a better striker than him. Like, when they were hyping up Islam back in, like, I'm talking five fights ago. When they were hyping this guy up, that was the consent. Like, everyone was saying, watch out for Islam. He strikes better than Habib on top of the grappling. That's what a lot of people were saying. You know? So, I have to have to believe it. And from what I've seen, the guy's got talent. Now, Oliveira's striking's got tremendously better. He's got the jiu-jitsu. But I have to be honest with you. If I'm taking a high-level striking grappling wrestler... Sambo background, whatever the fuck it is, compared to jujitsu, I'm going with the neck beard all day. All day. Now, Charles Oliveira brings something else to the mix. He's got that power and he's got very good striking. His striking's gotten significantly better. So he does have that to add to the equation. I cannot think, like, I cannot think of a world where this thing doesn't go to the ground. If, if Oliveira pulls guard, I see Islam in there mauling him. So, I mean, I just have to go with that. I have to. Is Islam going to sub- submit Makachev? I think you have a better shot of him knocking him out. I think that's a better chance. So that's why I'm leaning heavy towards Islam. I'm picking Islam. I know it's not, you know, it's not that sexy underdog pick, but I understand why he's a favorite. I, I, I still, I don't know. Like, I feel with all the people, though, picking Islam, I mean, um, Oliveira, there's a lot of people picking him. Like, I don't know. Let's, let's see. Let's see what the chat says right now. Let's see where we're at. I'll put a poll in real quick. It makes for a fascinating fight. You know, the fact that we are we're we're di- very divided here makes makes it even more exciting. Because if everyone was like, oh, Islam's gonna maul him, Islam's gonna maul him, it's just not fun. But the fact that my co-host is saying the same thing, you know, she's she's hard on she says Charles has got it. Uh let's see. Okay, so it's in the chat. Mike Jackson needed that loss. He did. He did. They will call him 2.0 Habib, uh, so he'll need to challenge uh, Habib (laughs) to fight like Rocky V. Could you imagine? The coach comes out of retirement. Here's the thing. Let me just say this. Islam Makachev wins, right? And Conor McGregor rattles off like two wins or something. I mean, even one win. The UFC will do everything in their fucking power to have the protege fight Conor McGregor. Everything in their power to do that. And and it doesn't make sense when it comes to the rankings in any way. But we're talking like, we're talking Rocky shit right there. Like that shit is, <laughs> it's insane to think about. You don't really have that with Charles. You don't. I mean, okay, Conor knocked out a little Brazilian 13 seconds, the GOAT, Josie Aldo back in the day. Doesn't have the same thing as Habib's protege versus. I mean, that is fucking nuts to think about. But Connor has to win. You know, he has to. I want Charles to win, but I think Islam takes it. I think most people uh, just don't like Islam. I'm one of them. Okay, that's fair. Jesse's like that. Jesse just doesn't like Islam. You can just tell she's just she's not. But I don't want to speak too much for her. I'll let her explain it when she comes on. What do you think on the Paul versus Silva fight coming up? In my opinion, I don't like it uh, for Silva. He's going to get knocked out. Uh, got bad feeling, uh, bad choice. Um, 
I love it and hate it at the same time because <sighs> you think Silva's going to get knocked out? Yeah, the, the potential of Silva getting knocked out by Jake Paul is something none of us want to see. And it's there. It is there. But I like it because it is finally he's fighting a guy his size with skill. I know he's old, but if Silva gets slept, I will cry. Is Islam married to his cousin? Maybe. I don't know. I don't no idea. I don't know what's going on in his personal life. If Ali Abdelaziz would loosen up the shackles, I'll know. But he won't let, you know, he won't let his guys come on. Willie made like a two million. Silva gets paid great regardless. Yeah, he's making bank for sure. All right, let's talk about this third fight. We'll talk about uh, Dariush too and Gamera. But let's uh, talk about the... Uh, you know what? I'm going to be making my lock picks on Friday, okay? So I'm going to lock them in, in stone. Is there... Hold on, let me see. If there, is there a press conference for 280? UFC 280 press conference. Let's see. Oh, there is one. Oh, boy. Okay, when is this? It's going to be at a weird time, though, right? Everything you need to know about the press conference. Uh, Thursday, October 20th. What time? I need a time. On so there is one. You guys down for that? When the hell... Oh, Mike Jackson. Check out Discord. Go to Discord for the Mike Jackson memes for sure. Go go to Discord for that. Um, Hold on a second. UFC 280. Once again, thanks for everyone coming on. 100 likes. Appreciate that. You guys are wonderful, wonderful. wonderful, wonderful. Got a new Chell video dropping tomorrow. Tuesdays and Thursdays, you'll be seeing Chell on our channel. It says how to watch, but what time is it? UFC 280 press conference stream how to watch. Uh, let's see. One of the biggest events in the company in 2022. UFC press conference are usually available. Blah, 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 blah. Here's everything you need to know about your 280 press conference, including how to watch the event live on demand. Okay. How do you watch it? The pre-fight press conference for the event from Abu Dhabi will take in place October, it's Thursday, October 20th. Be able to watch uh, Action Prefight Presser via the company's official website, YouTube channel, Facebook, and Twitch. Um, that's for the live stream. What time is it? See, this is the fight. Come on, give me a time, man. It's going to be at a weird time. But if it's at a time where we can stream it, one's in the chat if you'd be down to hang for a UFC 280 press conference. I would. I mean, I mean let's check their YouTube channel. And see if uh see UFC. Two eighty. Here we go. Pre fight press conference. Oh, the embedded's are dropping too. I gotta watch Will Harris's thing too. UFC two eighty press conference. Alright, so this is that other one. Yeah, I don't think it's scheduled yet. I don't know what it's gonna be. Little D, you down? Let's go. All right, so me and Little D are going to be streaming it. Okay. All right, you'll hang out, Hammer? Okay. We got two people. We got two people jumping in the stream. All right, we got guaranteed two. Uh, last time in Abu Dhabi was uh, 4 o'clock. The 13 rookie? All right, let's go, baby. Let's watch. Let's do it together. Alfredo? Okay, let's go, Alfredo. Thank you. Okay, good. Good, good, good. All right, I'll keep an eye on what time that is. So like I said, on uh, Wednesday night, we're going to have the matchmaker, my book, uh, not matchmaker, uh, odds maker, mybookie.ag coming on the show. So we'll be talking odds for UFC 280. So more tons of UFC 280 conversation. We'll have the press conference Thursday, whatever time that's going to be. Uh, Fuka Friday is going to be heavy uh, post weigh-ins talking about UFC 280. Maybe I'll, I don't know, I'll lock in the picks, but maybe I'll switch my mind once again. I've been flip-flopping for the co-main. Aljamain Sterling, uh, versus Pete, uh, uh, TJ Dillashaw in the co-main event. We spoke about it before. We'll speak about it. Quickly again, who do you have? Aljo or TJ? I moved over to TJ's side. Chat who you have really quick. Sterling versus the Snake. Who you got? Who you got? 
Uh, one, 1. 1.5. Timothy's uh, got the one over there. Okay, so we got people in the building for that. You know, looking at this poll real quick before I take it down. Uh, wow. Okay. So look at this. The chat has Charles Oliveira winning 59% over Islam 41. I don't understand. I don't understand why the odds makers are making this Islam the favorite. I really wish it would. Sw I hope the line switches because then I'll. I might place money either way on that fight, but. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Let's see. TJ, TJ, TJ. Leaning Aljo. Interesting fight. TJ and New. Sterling. I'm um, deep throating Islam. I, I'm. Listen, he's going to win. I mean, I don't know what you want me to do. Do you want me to tell you who's. Like, do you want me to lie to you? You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't understand. Like, if he wins. Am I still TJ? Am I still uh, deep throwing? No, I'm just I'm just giving you like spoiler alert. I'm telling you who's gonna win. You know I I think you know it's nice of me to do that. Why would I lie to you guys? It's not gonna switch. I don't think. That's why you know some people don't like watching our show because it's like a, you know you get spoilers to the fights, and some people watch because they want to make money. So if you're looking if you're looking to make money, you're cool with spoilers. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you don't want spoilers, then do not watch our show. Because I'm money. They call me Money Moss, baby. They call me Money... What did, what did I hit on that underdog last week? I mean, come on. They call me Plus Money Moss. That's what they call me. It, when you're talking the Plus Money, that's me. Plus Money Moss. All right, so it seems like the chat is, is leaning towards TJ. Okay. How bad would it suck to be on Islam as the favorite and still lose your money? Uh, yeah, it'd be terrible, right? If you're placing a bet on Islam and you lose the money, that'd be terrible. I'm really hoping he becomes the underdog because everyone's picking Charles. Everyone, it's so weird. This is like the first time, like the, the whole internet is like swaying towards Charles Oliveira. The fighters are swaying, uh, although Sadiq wasn't. So why is Islam the favorite? We're, I'm going to ask uh, the, the uh, betting guy uh, on Wednesday. The odds maker. It's, it's interesting. Odds makers just set lines. It's now... Uh, it's now how the public is, uh, but I don't think that's the case. I think they, they keep their eyeballs on, you know, what the public, you know, where the buzz is going. I would imagine. I mean, if they just, I mean, I know that they look at the fight and then they throw a line out there, but the lines are always adjusting. And the reason why they adjust is because of the fans and the picks and the predictions and the buzz. I would guess. We'll find out for sure on Wednesday. That's my, that's my, my guess. Like I'm not a, an odds maker, so I don't know. Okay, here we go. Jan versus O'Malley. Sugar Show. I am taking a massive gamble on this one. I am not confident. In fact, if I see the face-off, something different, if I pull any different information, I might jump off the underdog, but he, I'm still sticking on Sean. I am in a, a massive uh, minority with this one. Massive. By the way, our poll for Charles now 61%. I'm going to take that off. But 61% saying Charlie Olives for the win. So I don't understand why the odds are the other way. But yeah, I'm, I'm leaning towards Short O'Malley. I am very... I'll have a safety bet. So I'm going to make a bunch of bets on this card. We're going to have a lot of action on UFC 280. So stand by for the uh, the Friday stream. It's going to be wild. We're going to throw a bunch of bets out there, see what we hit on. But Sean O'Malley is a gamble. It's a gamble. I am not confident in my underdog pick, but I'm leaning towards Sean. So let me know if there's any crazy people like myself on Sean O'Malley. So how about this? Holy smokes. Other than Makachev, I got Dillashaw now and Sean O'Malley. So two underdogs in the top three. Two underdogs. TJ, O'Malley, Makachev is where I'm going right now as we stand on Monday. Things could change. Press conference, face-offs, my mind could change. Who knows? Maybe I'll swing to our Charles Oliveira. I might be able to pull the information. He's got some crazy stare-downs. He might scare me and pull me in the other direction. But right now, in the third fight over here, Sean O'Malley is the guy I'm picking. And I gave my reasons at nauseum before, and I understand why people are picking Jan. I get it. But I'm going with the hunch. Let's see what the chat says. Uh, it's amazing how people still don't understand how lines work. Well, we'll have a, it doesn't matter. It'll be solidified on Wednesday. And everyone will understand. 
You might not even understand. I'm taking Sugar uh, if it uh, if he's uh, confident. I like Jan. But he got humped by Aljo for the entire fight. That has to be on his mind. O'Malley got a big size advantage. Sean O'Malley has pink hair for this fight. He does. Mrs. Stretch O'Malley. Parlay TJ, Charles, and O'Malley. And get rich, says Daddy Big Dick. Nope, 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 nope. How I make my bets is this. I know it's not, it's not glamorous, but I've said this before. If you're new to the stream, I'll explain it again. The money that I've lost is on parlays. Every time I combine bets, now I hit on one parlay to start off. That's usually how it works. You make your first bet, you hit on it, you think you're invincible. That's what happened with me. I hit on like a three fighter parlay, all underdogs. I did fine. I did pretty good on that. So I thought I could do it every time. No, bet straight up. Make safety bets because you're not going to hit on them all. Like once in a blue moon, you fucking, you, you get that lucky, that lucky string together you know once in a blue moon just make safety bets come out above and just keep collecting dubs you know what i'm saying you're gonna lose a fight or two make a bunch of bets make sure you have safety bets in play and away you go i think makachev is gonna win in this situation he could be a safety bet for me my worries are tj and sean o'malley their worries but i gotta be honest with you i worry more way more about sean than i do tj but yeah, you got to make Chukagian. I'm going to put a bet on her. Chukagian over here is a plus 160. Let's look at my bookie. I might have to put the Chuk Chukagian bet in now. I don't like to bet on women's MMA. But when I see Chukagian and plus money, I understand Fioro is good. But I mean, Chukagian decisions are like locks. She's got like the most decision wins in the UFC history. I don't know if Fioro is going to be the gal that's going to stop what's going on. You saw the blemish against uh, Jessica and Draj. I don't think Fioro is going to do it. I think you can lock that up for a decision for her. I mean, how the fuck is Chuke getting an underdog in this fight? Put some respect on Caitlin. So that's a safety bet. I'll probably drop four bets on this card. Three unders. Making three underdog bets. Anyway, uh, all right, so let's move uh, to Darius versus Gamrot. Who's the underdog? Guy? Uh, oh, Benny's the... Oh, fucking A. God damn. I like... I tell you what. Tasty. Tasty underdogs. Last loss was uh, Kuda de Leeds. Gamrot looked pretty good in his last fight, though. Only 31 years old. Beat Sarukian, Ferreira, Jeremy Stevens, Holtzman. Benny's been out of the game since, what, a year and four months against Kakui, Fiera, Ferreira, Scott Holtzman. Fucking A. Oh, my God. I might throw another one here. Uh, how? How is O'Malley going to win? Okay, a bunch of different ways. If you're, if you're new to the stream, I'll tell you why I'm leaning in this direction. Okay? Pressure on the shoulders more on Peter. Three round fight with a fighter that, you know, doesn't like come out the gate hot, you know, comes out like he's a, he's a solid fighter, Peter. I mean, he, I mean, he really is. The guy is fantastic. No doubt about it. Some people say he's the best, best boxer in the UFC people, you know, the way he strikes, he protects himself nicely. You know, he could trip people down like Aljo. He did over and over and over again. As a fight progresses, he gets better and better. Three rounds. I feel Sean's going to come in hot. I feel, I feel Sean's going to come in hot. I feel like Sean is going to be able to do enough for the three rounds to get the points. And by the way, talking about, oh, he's going to leg kick him and this and that. I don't know if you recall the last fight, you know, uh, which was weird against uh, Pedro Munoz. When Pedro was throwing those kicks, Sean was turning his leg and checking those violently. Pedro was coming in. These checks that Sean was throwing out there, Sean wasn't feeling a thing. He's made the adjustment. So the leg kick thing, oh, Sean's going to get leg kicked to death? Okay. He clearly didn't want to watch the Pedro Munoz fight. He turns deliberately into it. Sean's a way smarter fighter than people realize. He sounds like a fucking moron on his podcast, and when he's gaming, and oh, I'm smoking weed, and I'm hanging out with this person. And that. He's not stupid. He's not. Sean O'Malley is making the appropriate adjustments in this fight that, I got to be honest with you, he's going to have an answer for everything. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm leaning. And getting the plus money over here, 
I know he shouldn't technically win this fight, but at plus 255, I mean, why not throw money on the kid? You know, why not? So so I think the rounds, I think his 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 length, I understand, you know, you had Sanhagen fight Jan and people are trying to do this MMA math bullshit or whatever. You know, listen, it's a different situation. Sean is going there with nothing to fucking lose. He doesn't lose in the rankings. He's fighting the fucking number two guy, right? How, what, what rank is uh, Jan at? Sean is not supposed to win this. Yeah, Jan is he's number one. Excuse me. Fucking number one. He's jumping up from... Where is Sean? Oh, there it is. 12. Like our last cast. Jumping up from 12 to 1. What the fuck does he have to lose? What does he have to lose? Nothing. He is dangerous. Peter Jan loses this fight. He loses everything. Like, I mean, it is just a massive blow on Peter Jan. Way more, way, way more weight on the shoulders. And coming off a win where Aljamain Sterling humped himself to a victory. Kind of embarrassing to lose like that. Now, twice to Aljo. I know the first one kind of doesn't count, but still. I'm telling you right now, you can make a strong argument that Sean O'Malley wins this fight. You can. I'm not saying it's a guaranteed lock, but I say, you know what? As a big underdog, worth making the bet. Worth it. Worth taking a shot. No, oh, but uh, Jan's experience and his opponents and this and that, Sean's untested. I tell you what, I see the adjustment Sean's making. And he's got power. He's a very good striker in his own right. His jujitsu is underrated. People don't realize that the kid could grapple. Going with sugar. Darius Gamrot. I mean, Darius getting plus money too. I tell you what, this is like an orgasm for underdogs. You know? Gamrot, I understand why he's the favorite. I get it. He's sexy right now. Gamrot's sexy. He's fresh off this win, what, three months ago against Sarukian, who people were sucking off Sarukian, saying he was the next best thing. And Gamrot says, well, pump the brakes. Pump the brakes, I'm here. Gamrot's legit. This fight over here is a silent banger. This one over here thrown on the card. People get your popcorn ready because not everyone is tuning in for this fight, but it's going to be damn good. Damn good. I tell you what, like there's a part of me that wants to lean towards Benny. I'm going to make this prediction when they face off. I need to see them face to face. I need to pull the information. But with with Benil Dariush getting plus money in this fight, disrespected once again, I got to be honest with you, I'm leaning towards Benny. I'm leaning towards Benil Dariush. I could do terrible on this card, the way I'm, I'm, I'm favoring these underdogs. But I love it. I love this matchup. I think it's a lot of fun. And I'm going to lean towards Benil at this moment. I'm not saying it's locked in stone. I can see something from that face off where I'm like, yeah, Benny's not getting it. But right now, where we stand, Benil Darius for the win. The channels that make prediction shows this early in the week, do not use them for betting. Use it for entertainment. If a channel releases a video today, tomorrow, this is a lock. That person is a lock. Without even seeing a face-off or how are they on the scale, do not bet on those channels. You need your fucking head examined. Do not. Wait for all the information. Wait for a show, a show that fucking takes that information in. And then make the bets. Do you understand? I'm trying to help you out here. If a show comes out Monday or Tuesday, here's my predictions for this and that. Those predictions mean nothing. They mean nothing. They don't even have all the information. How could you fucking watch a show and take what they say... And put money on it when they don't have all the information. In fact, they're scamming you. Never do that. Watch it, enjoy it, like it, that's fine. Never put money behind it. Don't do it. I'm telling you right now. Don't do it. If a show waits for all the information, then gives you their lock picks, go for it. You have a better you have a better chance of winning that way. That's that's my opinion. That's my opinion. Who you have? Uh, D Darius or Gamron? Let me know in the chat. Uh, that's a tough one. It beats me. Yamato Nishikawa. Only 19 and 30 pro fights. Nuts. Big underdog, says Christina Bueno. Talking about Yamato. 
I mean, getting no love, right? Why are we getting no love with that? Put a little respect on the name they're saying in the chat. Let me show you the fight. Odds can change. Yeah, see, that's the problem. People want to lock in if they got good odds. If that's the case, if you feel like there's an odd that you don't want to, you don't want to move too much, okay, fine. That will be that'll be the exception to the rule. Okay, if you if you don't want to wait for that, I gotta be honest with you. Wait, fucking wait. Get all the information. Get the get the guaranteed money rather than. Uh, but then some people just like to gamble. You know, people just like to roll the dice. Okay, so Yamato is a plus 400. He's fighting a beetle. Magomed Mustavavavavav. Magomed coming off a loss against Brad Riddell. By the way, Brad Riddell a little overrated. Just saying. The guy's fun. He's a beast. But I don't know if he's as good as I thought he was. I thought this guy was a little bit better. He's on a two-fight losing streak to decent guys. Jalen Turner's a fucking monster for the weight class. And Fiziev. Is a beast too. He's a problem. Beat Drew Dober, which is a really solid win. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, I don't know. Riddell, you know, that's that's a whole nother conversation. But um This guy Magomed can I mean he's got the fucking Ringo hair. All he needs is that neck beard, and then ba boom, you got him. He's in his, you know, got home court advantage. This kid's only 19. Yamato. 19. Making his debut. I got to be honest with you. I understand why he's the underdog. So help me out in the chat. So whoever said that about Yamato, give me more information on this guy. Like, like I mean, he's got a lot of fights. He does have a lot of fights under his belt. But he's only 19 years of age. Do you think he's going to get it done? I mean, I, you're not even a man, Ben. Interesting. It's an interesting fight. Okay, I flipped a coin. It's the Darius. <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> Fair. I agree to wait, boss. All right, cool. Yeah, listen, I mean, listen, I, here's the thing, too. I, I feel very guilty if people are putting money on my, my picks. If I'm telling you, hey, lock it up, lock it up, I do. I hold guilt because I don't want you guys to lose money. I don't. But there are certain situations where I throw it out there. Like, there are situations with Jorge Masvidal versus Usman where I was screaming and yelling at people betting on Masvidal. I was like, stop, stop. Like, sometimes I'll see it clear as day. But other picks, you know, you... You listen to people like me or whoever's a, an analyst out there. You take the information. You make your bet. Good luck. But I do. I feel guilty. Like, if I'm giving you my predictions and picks, I want to make sure that it's someone I genuinely feel is going to win. You know? He's 19 Japanese. As all, uh, as all get out. Watching him now, 18 last month. That's crazy, man. That's young. 19 years old. Abu Dhabi. Putting him up against the sniper. Damn, this kid's got balls of steals. Sign that contract. I really uh, do. I'd give you uh, fifty dollars to uh, come and call. Wait, wait, hold on a second. What are you saying, Moss? You're not even a man now. That's true. I'm not. I'm just kidding. I like you, Moss. I really do. I'd give you fifty dollars to come on a call for real. I pay up for. I don't even know what you. What are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. I honestly have no idea what you're talking about, but feel free to give me $50. I'll take it. I'll take it incredibly, incredibly fast. I'm trying to see if there's anything else that stands out. So, like, uh, an alarming um, underdog that pops out is Chukagian. Like, I, that just, it just really, it's just, like, glaring. You know, she seems like the decision queen. I feel like she's going to get that dub. This is a fascinating fight, Muhammad versus Brady. This is, this is very interesting. I know Bilal gets a lot of heat online. I give him heat as well. I find him very boring. It, what's interesting is Bilal is boring uh, in the cage, and Sean Brady's boring on the mic. If you put them together, you could have the most boring fighter of all time. And Brady's last fight wasn't that great against P Chiesa. He got the win, but it was kind of boring. He submitted Jake Matthews. How good does Jake Matthews look now? Who just said he has another fight. Uh, Christina Aguilera he beat, the, the pop singer. Bilal getting plus money at 115. Do you feel this? You know, there's value there. Bilal's on a real good run after that weird Leon Edwards situation. Where's the Leon fight? Oh, here it is. The no contest. Like that thing, I got to be honest, Leon was going to win that thing anyway. But 
uh, unanimous decision on Dam- Damian Meyer, humped the fuck out of Steven Thompson, a Vicente Luque. That was a solid win. That was a solid win. But let's be honest. I mean, it's just like, let's snuggle, you know? And he's good at it, so I don't blame him for doing it. Lost to Jeff Neal. He's got some solid wins. Beat Randy Brown, our buddy over there. I, I got to go Sean Brady. I'm sorry. Maybe it's bias by me. I feel like Sean Brady is just like another breed. He's like built out of stone. And he could be boring too, but I, I don't know. I just feel like he's a little bolder. Like a little bolder, you know? Can I moon you? If YouTube let me, I would. Everyone must have forgot Islam is a, a steroid cheat. Did he get hit for... Did he get hit for... I think there. I think there is truth to that, right? Islam... Didn't he pop for something? I, I for some reason I do actually do remember. Is that true? Or are we making that shit up? It's it seems accurate. Wasn't there some connection? Say, can someone confirm that? And if that is the case, I'm I'm curious why people aren't talking about that. Because yeah, that might be that might actually be true. I'm not like saying the guy is fucking dropping needles in his ass, but like, wasn't there something? Wasn't there some sort of like? I can't remember. Smoking if you got me, this is fake news. Let me see. I, I could have sworn I heard something like that back in the day, but I don't know. My you know, stories get mixed. Islam Makachev. It's not like anyone's talking about it now. USADA finds Islam Makachev not at fault for a Malone. Alright, so he wasn't he wasn't guilty. Islam Makachev accepts no fault after you saw the investigation. Okay, okay. So there was... Okay. So there was something that was he was accused of, but he got out of. After you saw the investigation. Mildonium. All right, that was 2016. Yeah, I remember. I do remember there was something. You saw it lifted his temporary suspension, and it was reinstated to fight Chris Wade. Okay. All right. So he wasn't 100% wrong. He wasn't 100% right. Okay. No, I remember that. I actually do remember that. And three other on his team popped? I do. Yeah, yeah. it's it's good that you dropped it in there. Because, yeah, I mean, listen. He wasn't guilty, so I, I can't hang him for it. But that is a story. And I got to be honest with you. If you're Charles Oliveira, like, that's the angle you go. Right? You just, you just call him a steroid. Like, you know, you just try to fucking accuse him of cheating or some shit. But Charles is not that guy. He doesn't need that stuff. Bilal versus Sean Brady, baby. Hit the like button. Who wins? Bilal, Sean Brady. Who wins this fight over here between these two? Remember the name or the one with no nickname? Sean Brady, Bilal Muhammad. I'm going to go Sean. I'm going back to the favorites. I know I've been picking a lot of underdogs. I'm going Sean Brady. I think Sean's going to get it done. I, I This reeks decision. But uh, Sean Brady by a decision. Uh, heart medicine, but it improves cardio endurance. So he was uh, definitely at an advantage for his earlier fights. Yeah, I don't know the logistics of what you can and can't take in drugs. But if you sort of found him innocent, you know, that's all I can go with. Tainted goat. <laughs> all right, who do we got? Who do we got? Charles? We're going we're gonna to roll through some of the fights that stand out on this card, and then I'm going to shut this puppy down. I want to say a big thanks to everyone coming out. I did want to talk about Deontay Wilder and his knockout. Um, was it legit or not? People were screaming on the internet that it was fake and it was a fraud. So, I don't know. Maybe we'll end the show on that note, but let's just get through these fights real quick. I thought they were super religious to check, uh, check against their god. Cheat. Uh, Deontay who come on come on you know who Deontay Wilder is did you guys fall asleep all right fuck you let's let's move on to uh (laughs) let's move on to the next fight yeah (laughs) I think I think the I think the chat fell asleep I don't know all right let's see Ozdemir versus Krylov on this card my goodness buried on the card crazy Makayev oh shit He's fighting the guy from uh, Fringe. Or what was that TV show? This guy looks like that actor. I always pull him up. Malcolm Gordon. Malcolm Gordon now on a, a two-fight win streak is a heavy underdog. Man, McIve has been a beast. Charles uh, Jordan, uh, Johnson. Cody Durden. It's a good fight. 
Woo! Ten years age difference over here. Damn, this is a this is a banger over here. This card is this is sweet, man. This is the second fight on the card. And then the GOAT, Lena Landsberg, 50 years old. Still doing it. Nah, she's 40. I added 10 years. Still doing it. I'm surprised they put a woman's two women's fights on here. Shocked. That's unacceptable. But they put them on here. All right, so those are the things that like kind of really stand out to me. A uh, Murdov. Oh wait, hold on. Let me not sleep on this fight. Murdov versus Baralo. <sighs> Woo! Damn, man, Baralo's on a run. Murdov lost to uh, Mirshart. That's correct. Shit, I forgot about that. Andrew Sanchez, the knee overhand right. Oh, it's a banger. Yo, his last win was what seconds, right? Kyle Baralo. Didn't he win in like fucking thirty seconds or some shit? Oh, it's a decision. Wait, hold on. I'm thinking the wrong guy. Petrosian was a decision. I'm thinking of the wrong Brazilian. God damn, I'm mixing my guys up. I remember this guy's a beast. He came from the Contender Series, right? Yeah, that's where he came from. Okay. I'm mixing my Brazilians up. They all look the same, these fucking... These damn Brazilian. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, so Contender Series got the win over here. Gazi beat uh, Armin Petrosian three months ago. All right. Good fight. Uzbekistan versus Brazil. Let's go. 32 versus 29. Not a bad fight. Sean Brady by KO. You think he KOs Bilal? He remembers the name. This is a good fight. A lot of good fights on this card. Really banging card. So like I said, Wednesday night, we will have the odds maker for mybookie.ag coming on the show. And if you want to bet, uh, promo code is MMAHOLES for 100% um, match on your first bet. So check this out. Mybookie.ag. You get a 100% match, 100% match in your first bet uh, deposit over there on mybookie.ag. So deposit the money, use the code MMAHOLES, and win big. Get that 100 match. Sheath Underwear, shout out to them. Got the best undies in the game. The promo code is MMAHOLES for 20% off of Sheath Underwear. Also, we got Head Rush, 20% off Head Rush swag. I got a Head Rush shirt on right now. Use our promo code MMAHOLES. Got this notorious shirt, Head Rush. Looking like a badass. I'll wear this at the gym. Makes you push more weight. It's great stuff. So use our promo code MMAHOLES for 20% off. CBDX.com is the website. CBDX.com for THC products. Promo code is MMAHOLES for 20% off. Must be 21 plus or older to purchase. And the last story to get to, Deontay Wilder. For those that actually saw the fight, happened on... Um, Saturday night, Deontay Wilder knocks out Hellenius, or whatever the hell the guy's name is. People were saying that it is a fixed fight, a fixed knockout. I watched it again. I still think it's legit, although the power, I mean, it's just crazy, this guy's power, how he comes in. So I want a quick yes or no in the chat. If you did see it, fixed or not fixed, let me know, Deontay Wilder. I'm going to still go with no, but I understand boxing is suspect. So what do you say in the chat? Coffee Time says the 13 rookie. I'm about to get some lunch and I'm about to go to the gym. Uh, not fix is Christopher Atkins. I'm with you, Chris. And we got the same name. So that's wonderful, wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Didn't know he fought again. <laughs> he did. You know what? They did terrible promotion. It was on Fight TV. They did do a bad job promoting that thing. So it was a layup, in my opinion, for him. So I, if you mixed it, missed it, don't blame you. Uh, Mr. Squishy says it wasn't fixed. All right, so uh, it looks like people are coming in saying not fixed. Let me know in the comments section if you're watching the replay. Smash the like button. If you missed Sadiq Yusuf, we did about an hour and 30 with the guy. Fantastic time talking to Sadiq. So uh, let me know in the comments section down below what you think. What should be next for Sadiq Yusuf? Let me know your UFC 280 picks down below over here and if you're watching the replay you want to hit us with a super thanks or whatever you could drop a donation clicking on that little heart over there or hit our Streamlabs donations as well thank you to those for joining us today on the show thank you Sadiq Yusuf for coming on thank you to Julian Lane once again and don't be an a-hole be an M-M-A-hole <laughs>